the long-term workforce plan. And um, we've got some of our regional people, Verity and Emma, um, for the item on operational um, delivery, the item on mental and medical and dental trainees, and, and Matthew uh, Wassel Coop. Do I do the pronunciation? Yeah. Matthew, yeah. Okay. Matthew, so. All right, he's on his way. He's one of our fellows. And then from the Royal College of Surgeons, we've got Josh Burke and Martin King. Um, are you from? Yeah. Sorry. So this is where I get into real political <laughs> trouble, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you welcome. Right, I think that's uh, uh, welcomes. Now, Dawn, do you want to do your comings and goings? Yes, um, apologies. Um, so I will have to go to a meet, another meeting at 10 o'clock um, and come back at half past 10 um, and then another meeting at 12 o'clock. Uh, so we leave the board a bit uh, early and challenge the step into me. Yeah, so that's yeah. about industrial action and yeah. about long term workforce planning. So that's why uh, Nadina needs to step out to do those things, which is um, uh, just a reflection on how much is going on at the present time. So without further ado, um, can I do um, declarations of interest? Are there any declarations anybody wishes to make over the robot in the north? Okay, thanks very much for that. And then uh, if we can turn to the minutes of the meeting we held on the 14th of December, um, any comments on the accuracy of the minutes? I'll take them all, actually. So anybody want to raise any issues on the minutes? No, uh, so we can approve those. Are there any matters arising on the minutes? Oh, sorry, matters arising on the minutes. Not on the agenda. No, okay. Um, so they're approved and agreed. And then there's an additional decision um, to be ratified by the board, which is we took the item on voluntary redundancy by correspondence. Um, I think that has been approved now by correspondence. So I just wanted a formal minute of the board to record that the VR scheme that has been uh, now agreed by NHS England's board as well as agreed by the Health Education England board. So, um, colleagues, thank you for that. And um, we've got uh, that minute. Um, in terms of the action log, uh, most of them relate to um, the transition. And we've got an item uh, on the public agenda and um, uh, an item on the private board agenda where I think uh, a number of the issues around VR, etc., are probably better discussed on that private uh, board meeting um, later. So if I can then go to sorry, Marina, uh, the board agenda planner, um, which is uh, the only thing I would want to, to raise is um, the People's Advisory Forum, which is a subcommittee of this board meeting. Uh, has been having a discussion about whether it has a life beyond the 1st of April. And I think the spirit of the uh, forum is that they want to continue to make a contribution. Um, but those arrangements need to be put in place, not by HEE, but by NHSE. So there's a piece of work that needs to be done. And that be uh, so uh, things like uh, travel expenses can be paid. Uh, for those colleagues that attend those uh, meetings. Uh, I think the workforce function will require uh, people who have lived experience making a contribution to the planning and the design of services, uh, but we need to find the mechanism by which we can secure the future. They all want to continue to make a contribution. So I draw attention to that because we can't really have a board planner beyond the 31st of March. Um, so, uh, which is um, uh, how, it, how it's caught. Um, so, with that, Navina, um, let's turn to your uh, report, if we may. Uh, I, I propose we don't take questions to Navina on the transition. We use the transition items uh, uh, to do that, but um, Navina, over to you. Thank you. Um, so, the, um, the board will have the full paper. Um, I just want to take a moment to reflect on where we are 
uh, both in the NHS and within HEE, um, as this is our last but one meet board meeting. Um, so um, this is our, also our first meeting of 2023. Uh, I think it's really important for us to acknowledge how busy and difficult the Christmas and New Year period has been for everyone and a rather trying and difficult end to the year for our colleagues across the NHS, um, including, of course, our, our learners and trainees. Um, and they've done a really fantastic job in uh, supporting the NHS. Um, when many people were able to take a break uh, over this last period of time, uh, those have, of our trainees and colleagues have not been able to take a break and continue to work through the infested period. And also, of course, the pressures of the winter um, and uh, where people had voted to take industrial action. Um, and um, this is where I've got to go at 10 o'clock to, uh, to meet about, about the uh, junior doctor's um, ballot. Um, on that point, HEE's Gold Command continues to meet weekly along with the executive directors and regional directors. Uh, um, and we share our intelligence and escalate any issues if, if necessary. Uh, closely monitoring the impact on delivery of, uh, on education and training, um, and also uh, including the planned strike action announced by University College Union on Thursday. Uh, we, of course, will work to mitigate our impact on training and pipelines should it be necessary, and we'll keep the board informed of any, any updates. Um, across HEE, of course, we continue to support our service users, patients, um, the NHS and learners in 2023, uh, for the remainder of our time as an organisation, balancing the needs of each with uh, absolutely uh, the same effort, commitment and cooperation in this, our final year. And I'm really grateful to all of my colleagues in HEE who continue to, to, to work at this time when we are actually winding down as an organisation. Mm. Um, working with also national uh, NHS bodies, with government, with HEIs, with employers, with regulators, uh, to ensure that all that HEE does uh, is done well in these last few months and, of course, must continue this effort in the new NHS England. So the work towards formal transition to the new NHS England on 1st of April continues, including now close collaboration with our colleagues in the People Directorate and other parts of NHS England to design the future of Workforce Training and Education Directorate uh, that which is going to be our future, and we will hear a bit more about that uh, in the transition program update. Um, I just want to come back to the in December, I updated the board on the positive UCAS figures. And may I update you again today with regards to medical recruitment? It's underway for 2023 24 specialty recruitment for ST1 CT1 programs. Almost 34,000 applications have been received from over 20, um, and uh, from over 20,000 applicants, representing an increase in 20.9% and 11.6% respectively, compared to 2022. Um, and I think that is that is saying something. Um, so, um, so in in addition, uh, 9,091 applicants. Um, have been received for higher specialty training, ST3. That is 4% higher than in 2022. Um, over 11, so we need to make sure we look after these trainees, and that's really important to me, especially as we go into um, next year's uh, new organisation. Over 11,000 vacancies will be advertised across all specialties in 23-24. Um, and that includes 876 new programmes that have been recently announced to support mental health, cancer related specialties and elective recovery. So many of these additional posts will be special, uh, specifically targeted to tackle health inequalities and to ensure that training places are distributed fairly to best meet, meet the needs of patients in all parts of the country. That's a really important kind of step change in our work. Um, now, this is one of the last meetings of our board and for the organisation for the next couple of months. It will be a real challenge. Um, it's difficult and it's pressured, uh, but HEE continues to deliver the best outcomes uh, for our patients, for learners and trainees. And I, I do want to stress that again uh, about uh, how my colleagues in HEE feel as we will cease to exist in a, a few months time. 
Um, there are a number of for information items for the board um, so that you can keep track of all the work that we're doing um, and how our people have maintained the focus on delivery of our business in this context. Um, finally, I'd like to end on some good news, uh, recognition of our colleagues, um, our HEE's Allied Health Professional Lead uh, and Deputy Chief Allied Health Professions Officer for England, Beverly Harding, was awarded an MBE in the New Year's Honours List for Services to Healthcare. And I'd really like to um, offer my congratulations to Bev um, on behalf of all of us at HEE. She's formidable. We all know her well. Uh, I have to say, I think it's thoroughly well deserved the award of Beth Harden. Um, and she's a terrific advocate and ambassador um, for uh, allied health professionals. And, um, yeah, it's a bit of recognition in my view. But, um, uh, right, um, comment questions to Naveena, John? Just a, a quickie, really. It's just around, I mean, it's really great that we're able to increase the capacity in terms of the amount of training and, and everything else. I'm just uh, the only thing for me is just the slight concern I have around the um, higher, higher education infrastructures to take the world and scale of applicants and the capacity to deal with that process is becoming a real strain on the system. If I just give you an example, my own institution last year, uh, sorry, 2019, 40,000 applications a year, this year, 160,000 applications. The university sector is really struggling to um, manage the scale of growth of applications across the board. Obviously, this isn't just health, but health is going to be in the mix there. And that capacity is, is a bit of a challenge. What's driving it, John? Well, the growth in numbers, um, partly because there is a pent up, if you like, need to get to higher education. So a lot of that growth is in the international market. Yeah. But then there was a lot of UK students that deferred during the pandemic. So what you've now got is people who effectively deferred one year or two years and they're they're really pushing themselves forward. But it's just a, you know, it's it's a concern because the system capacity um, is, is struggling. And then we've talked about this, I think, in terms of nursing numbers, Mark, haven't we, about mm. the kind of demographic bubble of 18-year-olds that is just about to work its way through, which um, is a kind of once-in-a-generation bubble working its way through. Can I ask John a question? Um, so with the long-term workforce plan, and if we get to where we want to get to with that, and the publication is in it, there would be increased pressure potentially. Um, so, John, we need to work with um, with the centre to make sure that we are planning for that. Um, so, can I take this outside of here with them? Well, be the council probably and um, others to look at how proactive we can be. I think we've got a session coming up with the Universities UK. Yeah. yeah. When did you want to say anything about the increase in medical numbers? There's a lot of work going on behind uh, some of this. Yes, thank you. Uh, so uh, very grateful to have the nearly 900 new posts because they ease a number of reform programmes that would otherwise have got very sticky. Um, the increase in applicants is pretty much due to the international graduate population applying. Um, it's really it's really just filtering through from the November 2019 visa rule changes, um, which were a bit disrupted by the pandemic. Um, so uh, we have more training opportunities, but we don't have enough, frankly. And we certainly don't have enough to embrace the international medical graduate cohort into safe, long-term UK practice. Um, so uh, I think it, it's good news, um, but it's a small expansion by individual specialty, for example, 15 in public health, and we know there's a huge provincial agenda out there. Um, so uh, <laughs> in looking at different ways of managing capacity of applications, uh, having learned from COVID, so we have uh, managed to persuade all but one of the uh, colleges to continue with their COVID methodology, if you like, for recruitment, which is very efficient and allows us to uh, not have a three-tier shortlisting, long-listing and then interview process. Um, and that does help. Uh, but fundamentally, um, if we are to raise the quality of care in the NHS, we need more funded training programmes, uh, particularly in the years not to five after graduation, where we imprint people with the values of the NHS and the culture of the NHS and give them an opportunity to demonstrate their skills and learn and then higher training can take its pick of them. Um, uh, 
Uh, Soraya. Uh, thank you. Just uh, not to prolong the discussion, I think we might pick this up later on. I think there has to be a real recognition this year with the pressures, I think, of COVID, people taking gap years and coming back on. Um, certainly, this is probably the first year picking up a lot of students who had applied and they're the 18, 19 year olds with really good grades, not getting places. Um, and obviously, the determination is there because a number of them have decided to go on to another gap. Um, and reapply next year. Right. But it just seems there's something around that pipeline of talent in the system that we're not harnessing. Um, and, you know, it's really disappointing if we lose them. I think the other side, um, a number of HEIs and one in particular I'm involved in, their recruitment of international students to their medical undergraduate degree has been really very, very positive. And I think just to pick up on Wendy's point, again, it feels like what a waste of resource that we're training um, these individuals and then we might lose them because we haven't got the training post. So that whole pipeline from undergraduate right the way through to speciality training across the number of expansions that we're seeing with private medical schools mm -hmm. in the UK, there's got to be a piece of work HEE or NHSE needs to do. So the marriage between undergraduate education and training and the yeah. alignment yeah. to make sure yeah. that they're people are free. That, that modeling has been done. It's in a bunch of places, isn't it? I know. <laughs> Andrew. Thank you. And a question from, uh, from Lavina and also for Wendy, probably. I mean, it's really good to see the increased training numbers, in, uh, to see the concentration on the geography and also specialities that are need needed in mental health and oncology, excepting that some are perhaps not. We're not getting them all the how, how is this fitting in with our generalist approach? Um, and are we able to get numbers? How many of these can be generalist numbers? Um, and I suppose as well, do we yet have a handle on the numbers that are going through the CESAR route of training, you know, a more formal CESAR route of training rather than the HE route? Uh, so, um, a generalist programme is what everybody in Aspire to will go through in years not to five rather than a specific end point. So, it's not an end point, it's generalist skills that they will have. And they will be employed after five years of training, as the rest of the world has, you know, you finish after four, four or five years of postgraduate training, we don't in England and UK. Um, but you will be useful to the NHS with significant skills and wider skills in terms of the future understanding prevention, public health, population health, understanding wider understanding of you know, research ethics, all the things that we want all doctors to continue doing. Uh, so any expansion will feed into that. Uh, there are some uh, obvious ones that won't. So oncology is a higher programme that's been expanded. It's not a, 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 a core programme. Uh, so we, we are very conscious of the potential mismatch of higher training to uh, core or basic training. Um, and at this stage, the balance is right, but it is something that Cal and I spent a long time discussing pipelines and whether the funding fo follows through. Uh, but fundamentally, I think we need to look at potential for a really different shape to postgraduate training with a larger bulge of 0 to 5, uh, where we have a pool in which specialists can be you know, fished from or people can stay in for as long as they wish, because we know that uh, doctors in training want much more flexibility and more autonomy. They want to go and do other things. Uh, and perhaps the best worked example of that we've got at the moment is the work we're doing on the joint uh, CCT in general practice and public health, which is eight times oversubscribed. And will produce general practitioners with significant public health skills, which will support the public health service in a locality. Uh, so we'd like to, you know, that's, 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 that's a generalist approach. Um, and I can't remember what the, uh, so the question you know that I asked about the Caesar trade, the Caesar oh, training, yes. and um, how, I know we probably don't. So, so it's, um, I think it's fair to say that the conversion from a, a subgrade or, or a, a locally employed doctor through the Caesar route is small um, compared with the numbers of doctors in that grade. Um, I'm doing some work with the GMC to try and understand whether we can uh, take a global look at the Caesar pathway, i.e., what the regulations say. But actually, what, what we think is that it's much more around individual specialties wanting um, perhaps some interesting hoops to be jumped through by people who've been working in that specialty for a very long while um, and can't quite make it through. So uh, 
uh, we're looking specifically at some of the uh, specialties to see whether we can work with their colleges to uh, say the pathway says this is what they need but you add in this is this really what you want it's it's the old old composition of curricula and you have to know everything all the time when in fact you'll lose very little you'll use very little of it in your real job uh, but it's a piece of work we've taken on um, that I think really does need to continue. It's a four country piece of work as well, because it's really important that we use the leverage of the UK uh, with the regulator on this point of the colleges. Thank you. Could you say something about why it's strategically important to do this work in terms of the pipeline for doctors as well? Uh, because Attention. Um, uh, these are doctors that get disaffected. You don't get any better doing the same uh, job uh, endlessly repetitively. You do need to grow and challenge and learn. That that is part of professionalism. Um, and then um, so retention, uh, morale, uh, not having a career pathway, and then also plugging the consultant gaps that, that are there. You know, these are people that have the ability. If they're on the CC, if they've got a, on, on the special register, they can apply for consultant vacancies. They tend to be very embedded locally, so there's an opportunity there for local. You know, buy it and support this person to that and into that job that you need as a local employer. I think that's probably good. Yeah, no, very good. Very good. Yeah. And, it's a, and, it's, and fairness, actually, for me, it's a fairness issue as well. Probably a quality issue as well, actually. There's two of them. Yeah. Probably one of those days. Absolutely. So, so I. Thanks, David. So I, I just have a point on the redistribution of the juniors. I did a couple of trust visits in the last couple of weeks, and they're in the. They're all. One was a coastal one, uh, and the other one was a relatively small provincial DGH. And I'm just. And, and they were both both MDs and chief execs were saying they they're really struggling to staff general surgical roads to a general medical, all the basic things. And I, I don't know to what extent we targeted those type of institutions as part of our redistribution. Mm -hmm. So it'd be just to get a sense of that. Yes, we targeted the institutions. We haven't targeted all the specialties yet. Okay. okay. So we started with the specialties that have a 100% fill rate um, on our funded training yeah. programmes. Um, so obstetrics, haematology and oncology, I think. Um, uh, so we're, we're, start, we're going down the specialties uh, okay. rather, than, rather than the geographies. Um, so the geographies will so they, they will benefit from the obstetric redistribution. Okay, okay. But as you go down the rest, uh, will you have an eye for places like I mean, Kinslin? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's precisely the point. Yeah. That's precisely oh. the point. Okay. If helpful. they can deliver the requirements of the curriculum at that level, mm. which the majority can, yeah. pick in years not to five, yeah. and we have been and checked individually, the quality leads have been and checked individually because we've had all sorts of discussions around that uh, and now we've got the funding into the uh, post that we require to move then we can start shifting so okay. that program okay. starts it's a 10-year program though andrew because we, we couldn't persuade those that are uh donating and supporting this to move over faster this is a really important point isn't it i think about um what the staging and the steps are of actually this transition to uh, uh, the redistribution of uh, training force. Because the other thing I've picked up under on my visits is people thinking they'll be disadvantaged yeah. by this. And I think yeah. making the argument about where the improvements will take place and why, and this has been your argument all along, Wendy, isn't it, about why we needed additional money to actually be able to redistribute the course. Um, I think the overall loss in obstetrics in the London overall will end up as two posts in the end but the shift will take time yeah. to do that but it is it is really difficult and frankly as I said earlier I don't think we are training enough doctors training improves patient care not just in quality but in terms of experience and all, all the things that matter so you know we expand yeah. the training offer even at the early years level uh, which means a different funding split which Callum and I've talked about um, many times that will that will motor in this area particularly. I think we've just got to be mindful of the fragility of some services in some of these yeah. settings. Um, and there's all there's a perception that 
the the teaching hospitals in those regions will will you know dominate and, and gain at the expense of places like Scarborough that's or that's exactly you know. those are exactly the conversations yeah. we're having okay. regionally and locally. That's really helpful. And we're also offering the you know support that Patrick's putting in around workforce transformation and you do this differently, that it's not just about young doctors, it's also about the wider clinical team around it. And the other debate is about craft professions, I think, which has been around. So uh, there's a lots of sensitivities around this that needs to be actually um, played into this. <laughs> Bob. Yeah, it's just account, it was some of that in the counterpoint to Andrew's point about the Caesar is. I think we've been really clear that we need to think about the workforce in the round and hopefully that will come out in the long term workforce plan. I follow a guy on, on Twitter called Rob Fleming, who's part of the movement, hashtag SAS by choice. You know, so so thinking about actually being a SAS doctor is a perfectly <coughs> brilliant value role and sometimes we don't value that. So how do we think about a total medical workforce for the teaching hospital and for King's Lynn and for Lowe's Doctor, you know, and bring that in. And sometimes I, I think we haven't given sufficient, sufficient attention to that cadre of people or thought, oh, maybe they can become consultants, see if they can. Yeah. But how about, no, we want to do our job in this setting and how do we have training and supervision and stuff? And, and I think that is part of that kind of general school thing. Um, and I think that's really healthy. And uh, hopefully we'll stress that more than the other people. Yeah, really good Yes, thanks, Rob. And, and we've had this conversation about SAS doctors before, haven't we? And the value and the appreciation that needs to be added. Just, just to say the transformation program, you know, is an important component of this because even if you're receiving a, a, a lot more new doctors in training, you've got to prepare that in terms mm -hmm. of the infrastructure and how teams will work together. So we're doing that, and particularly the two geographies you've just mentioned are part of the rural and coastal program where we are targeting that support so that they are ready to take them. Time comes. Wendy, uh, the video has gone. But can I just uh, invite you to say something about like, say something about uh, the apprenticeship route into medical education as well, because that's the other significant um, development that's highlighted in the video. Yes. Uh, so this is um, this is something I've been really excited about for a long while. Um, uh, so as part of our expansion of medical schools, with five new medical schools. We wanted to look at widening participation in, in a number of structural ways as well as in uh, focusing on the students. Um, and one of the ways in which we've looked at this is through creating an apprenticeship route into medicine. Um, so these people will have a degree, they will be registered in the same way the GMC, approved, all the programmes are approved by the GMC. Um, and we've had all the approvals through over the last few months. And the final bit of job, I think it was inevitably the funding, um, and there's now an agreement between the Department of Education and the Department of Health, which I'm very grateful for. And we will be recruiting um, 200 uh, medical apprentices to start in the autumn, which is really exciting. I can't share the distribution publicly as yet, but we are splitting them across different academic units, ranging from the academic unit that has a traditional medical school but doesn't keep its own people in its region. Uh, a Russell group, um, one of the medical schools that has a clear population health approach to its training. And then um, one of our more entrepreneurial medical schools that's looking at different ways of training as well, which is the one bit that in our undergraduate medical programmes we have not seen significant innovation in the delivery of education, uh, the sort of iPad medic as they call it in the States. Um, so we, we will be able to share the four universities that are taking responsibility for the first, first cohort uh, very soon. Terrific. It's really exciting. And uh, you've given lots of clues in that introduction. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> still you still work it out. <laughs> you can try and work it out. That was the prices for those to get it right. No, but I just want to um, emphasise just how uh, significant a development this is. So thank you. Uh, right. Um, uh, although Naveen has gone, anybody else want to raise any of the any comments on uh, the report that we've got? <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you for that. So, if we can go to um, the committee's uh, report to the committee. So, I think um, performance and business committee. Uh, Andrew, is there anything you want to draw attention to? Thank you, David. Um, the report is there to be read. Um, 
I think the, to, to draw to attention at the moment, we're on track for performance in you know 29 out of 30 of the indicators, uh, and the one that we're not is is, is finance, but that is uh, is somewhat untidy at the moment. It's like a 10 million pound overspend, but some areas up, some areas down. Um, and as that gets sorted out, reasonable confidence that we'll get that to a good place. So uh, no no real concerns there, but it is an amber. Um, and we did a deep dive on cancer, which was was very helpful, but not, nothing to add to the okay. to the written report. Thanks. Callum nodding uh, affirmatively when we said we were. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's correct. And we're going to bring um, the Q3 results to the committee in February, because obviously we don't have a board. And... Okay, very good. Well done. Uh, hi, Priest, Solity. Just one thing to draw out, which was the uh, net survey that was done, hugely uh, high engagement rate and good responses that's being analysed at the moment. That will come to the committee in February, and then we'll also showcase to the board on the council. That was in any way. Very good. Very good. Very good. And, um, so right, do you want to say anything about in Andrew's absence? Yes, very quickly. Um, so the report has read, I suppose the two key issues is not to lose the momentum and the work that HEE has been driving around equality, diversity and inclusion. And I think that quite clearly um, the committee discussed in the context of handover to NHSE. Um, and I think the second issue, the bullying and harassment tool, at the next meeting, so again in February, we should be able to see the results of that. Um, I suppose a disappointment that some of the survey data um, and also around uh, feeling to speak up guardians is still raising issues around uh, discrimination, whether it be uh, um, race or disability. So there's still a really strong need to really drive this agenda and keep it going forward. Uh, and um, lastly, but not least, um, John. Audrey yeah, Lewis. so Audrey Lewis, obviously got the meeting on the 14th of December. We did have a meeting last week, actually, as well. And uh, an extremely good report that meeting. I asked Nicola if she can copy it around to the board members, which was a sort of more detailed layout of what work's been done, how it's been done, what's been achieved. And just to give reassurance, really, to everyone that we're working very hard on the transition process and a lot of that hand over. Um, is is being taken care of there, so so Nicola should, should do that. We also had an update last week on the annual report process and the annual accounts process, which I think also people we've got most things in hand, given the fact that most of us won't be around when uh, effectively those reports are finished and uh, concluded. So that was an extra meeting we had last week. You can see from the report itself on the 14th of December, we do have an internal audit report on postgraduate recruitment process and controls, which is related to the conversation we've just had, but the rest of it pretty much as the report says. We welcome Miranda Carter who came in and just to say that both um, the audit committees, if you like, are working together jointly just to make sure that there's smooth handover and no dropping of the ball between any of the sort of risks that exist with us now, but would continue into and um, NHSE is a ghost board. Very good. Very good. Thing. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, John. And um, just on the signing up process, um, at the action log, you'll see there's an update from Keith Wright in the department about what the process is for signing up the accounts as we go into next year. Actually, that it's Amanda Pritchard as accounting officer that we're responsible for, which is. Um, uh, as I expected to be absolutely frank, but it is confirmation that that's um, So, Philippe, uh, let's uh, turn to you. Once you've finished exchanging notes with Vicky. You can ask you where the beaner was, and I said, This is like being in 5B. <laughs> Do I need to add some spice? Concentrate. <laughs> Um, to are you joined by anybody for this license? No, no okay. um, but I will be drawing if there's any questions. Um, obviously, Vicky's here for the HR bit, and, and Giles has been uh, sorting out more about the legal part. So, if there's any particular questions um, when we get to that section, please direct them and we'll work it out. Yeah, okay. All right, over to you then. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm aware there's some people that might not know me, so um, I'm Philip Spicer. Um, I've actually been with HE since the beginning, so coming up to the 10th birthday, um, uh, so to close it down. Um, I was a regional director um, 
And I've been asked by Navina to lead the transition and transfer into the new organisation. So that's, that's me. Um, so there is a report in the pack. Um, I'll just pull out a few things, if I may. Um, and I'm aware we do have a, a section in the private board. Some of the detail I will have to leave to the private board um, because um, obviously the um, sensitivity around some of the, the uh, parts of, of the uh, programme that um, need, to, need to remain in that part of the board meeting. So um, there are different aspects to the programme, just to remind colleagues. We have the uh, due diligence that we started some time ago, and that is making sure that we absolutely know um, and have recorded all of our business. So that is everything from how many contracts we've got to our risks that others have mentioned, um, to our staff lists, etc., cetera, um, and to make sure we're ready for transfer. We have all nine of those worksheets signed off. There's a little bit to do on HR and OD, but it is... Um, it's sort of two sides of the same coin, if that makes sense. So the due diligence as we move in now to transfer. So it's little, it's the same little things. It's things around making sure we've got, you know, sort of 4,000 job descriptions um, and identifying gaps. So it's a lot of stuff um, and there will be gaps, but that's not gaps in the due diligence. That is just gaps in business that we will be clear about. And as we um, go over to um, transfer, um, a number of those areas will be dissolved. So it's, it's not something for us to worry about. Um, the risks are now reported to the audit committee. So it was nice to hear that that was discussed there. Um, and the due diligence has moved quite seamlessly into day one readiness. So actually, it was really good that we had done all that work in advance on due diligence because a lot of the information we're now being asked on the other side the day one readiness is the same information. So we've been able to respond really promptly to requests from NHSE colleagues, Miranda Carter and others about, you know, how many contracts have you got here? But they are, here's the list. So, so that's really, um, that was really good and really timely. Um, in terms of the day one readiness, just to also confirm, um, there was a, a workshop last week, just being really clear about some of the more, more um, the more, I think I was, I'm trying to think personal things we need to get into about onboarding. So what's the plan for our staff on day one? Not just, you know, do you have a new email address, but actually how do you operate? What's the program we need to do to help people actually kind of um, operate in NHS England? So there was a workshop last week building on the minimum day one readiness that you'll um, recall I shared at the last board meeting that had been done for NHS Digital. Um, because that's what brought forward, building on that and saying, you know, what else does, do we need to add to that to make it a good onboarding process? And remember, for HEE, that is that is challenging because it's not just about onboarding staff to the new work with training and education function. It's about onboarding our finance staff to the new finance function. It's about onboarding our HR colleagues into the new function. So we still have um, to maintain our responsibility for all of our staff transferring and make sure they all land where they will be landing in, in a right way, a safe way, and they know how to, you know, basics about get into the building and log on on day one. Um, so we're quite, we're quite confident around um, that work. Um, again, at audit, colleagues will know that there was an internal audit around the programme and we're waiting for the reports around how the programme um, governance internally has operated. So that's being complete. Um, so I'm just going to move on then to um, design. So um, as Naveen said, we've worked really hard over, uh, since the last board meeting to um, secure uh, agreement through the design authority of the overall design of the new workforce training and education national function. We have reached a position where we are going to the steering group, which is essentially made up of the NHS executive on Wednesday. And um, we are expecting that subject to some um, caveats that we believe we've addressed from the design authority, that we will be successful on Wednesday. Um, that means that if we can, if we can 
do that on Wednesday, then we are on target to consult with our staff, um, both, uh, well, we'll be consulting with our staff in relation to transfer starting at the end of this month, because we have to do that as well. So there's, there's you know, parallel consultations that will happen. But in terms of the new function, those staff affected, um, we should be able to consult with them um, any time from the 7th of February, which is what we said we would do. Now, that there's a huge amount of work to do to land that date. Um, we have to do literally this week a people impact assessment. So we have to look at detail into those staff affected going into the new national function and um, what that means for people um, in as much detail and as much of an individual level as we can. That will lead into the Equalities Impact Assessment, and we have a deadline for that as well um, by Monday. Um, we have to go through several governance routes um, between now and, um, if you like, go live. That includes trade union consultation, the Equality Impact Assessment Panel, um, and the People Impact Assessment is information that will we will sh you know that will feed those, but it's something that clearly will be very confidential and that will be kept kind of as a document that feeds. Um, we have to have our consultation document as well written for the 26th of January um, to again uh, share with our trade union colleagues. So. Um, so there's a huge amount of work to do over the next seven to ten days. Um, in a, you know, so if we get through the 18th, that there's still, there's still a huge amount of work to do to get through. Um, but we've got everybody teed up. Very grateful for uh, the design leads in terms of the national functions um, supporting their part of the um, new design this week in those various elements. Vicky and the team in terms of the HR. Um, aspects as well. So a um, lot of work to do, um, but we have a plan to deliver it. And I'll pause there, David, because I'll allow some time for any questions. Could you, before I open it up more broadly, we just, so if consultation from the 7th, I'm just thinking of the message to staff from this meeting about when will the process begin for them. So the consultation will begin on the 7th. I think we allow 45 days for consultation. Yes. So we just work that through to when the process of moving from the job that they've got now to the job that they will have, or for those people that are going to go for VR, what the timetable for that is. So um, and then, Vicky, I'll come to you on VR, because I think that is now agreed. Um, but, um, and we just need to tease that through. But, yeah, um, and one of the things I would like to stress, and thank you for um, kind of like dropping me, David, is the response to consultation. So this is a real consultation. We will launch the consultation, as we said, if we can get through these, these um, governance parts um, close to the 7th. It will close, I think it's the 16th of March. We want to ensure that we allow two weeks for response to consultation. It has to be meaningful consultation. Um, and so then we will be transferring. So the timeline will mean that all staff would have transferred subject to those that might have um, gone down the voluntary Duncey route. Um, and then we will begin the process of the detailed implementation. But we've been very clear that um, we need to do this in a sensible, measured and um, transparent way and we're not going to rush the end of consultation straight into starting it. But what that means then is the process of people moving yes. will not begin until April. Exactly. Yeah. That's, 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 that's what I wanted to understand. draw out actually yeah. because I think what staff exactly. will be interested in is what is that what is that go live day for the process to begin? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you will you say something about VR? Um yes, yes. Uh, all board members, exec and non-exec, have now seen this. It's been approved by the NHS England Board. We've formally noted its approval through correspondence and registered that today. Is there anything you want to say about that process? Um, uh, other than to say that the comms will go out this week. We've got a session with our leaders tomorrow to take them through things in more detail. There's a session with the exec last week. Um, and there'll be comms to the whole organisation that goes out this week. It's quite a tight turnaround because obviously it was sitting on desks for 
some time. But this is the first launch of VR, and it's our intention still to work, to, to launch another VR scheme coterminous with the launch of consultation that will be more targeted at the specific impact of the design. So this is so when do we launch the VR uh, scheme? This week. Wednesday. This week. Yeah. So the comms is also a launch of it. So from this week, people will be able to make an application. Right, yeah. And then when the structures are consulted upon, that will be the other opportunity. That's so right, yeah. two opportunities. And that will be specifically targeted at where roles are reducing or uh, um, in, in number. So those are the applications that will be welcomed for that launch. Can I, can I just say one thing in relation yeah. to your question yeah. about timelines? It's probably just important to know that because of the timeline, as, uh, as Philippa rightly said, that with this consultation will therefore be an HEE and an NHSE one, yeah. because it will straddle the two organisations. Yeah. It's a small point, but just an important government's um, point. It's important. Uh, we need to. And actually, the transfer orders that transfer people from HEE to NHSE run separate to all this. That's right. Yeah. 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 We'll and we're, that point out. we're really trying to get our comms very, very clear on this. I mean, consultation is a concerning time for anyone and all of us are going to be subject to two consultations, as Philippa rightly says, one for transfer and one for transformation. Yeah, and I think it's a nice distinction, transfer and transformation, and there's two going on and we're going right. to be running in parallel. To be very, very clear about which one is asking what questions and people need to be clear what they're responding to. Charles, yeah. so, is there anything you want to say by way of introduction before I throw it over? Uh, I think only just to say thanks to board colleagues uh, for contributions to the response we sent to the Secretary of State, or you, you and Davina sent to the Secretary of State at the end of last week on the on the draft regulations. The department has logged it, um, the senior officials, the directors, both the workforce and uh, Finish thing the sponsor of our discussing how to respond, I gather. Um, we worked, of course, very closely with NHS England colleagues on the on the details of regulation. Um, and I don't think, I mean, I, we, I'm not sure we have sent it round to board members yet, but we should probably send your, your letter to colleagues. And I think it, frankly, is a, is a public document because the consultation was a legal consultation. Um, so uh, you know, I think we should publish it. Actually, but, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I think I, certainly the Secretary State's letter and summary of the regulations. Yeah. The regulations were a slightly earlier version, which are still being worked on. Um, our, our response focused very much on the big, big issues, which I think was the right approach, uh, given where we're coming from, um, uh, and lodged the request, obviously, around the mandate um, that uh, the NHS one should include workforce as a education and training as a obligatory item uh, agreed by the department, if not in statute. Um, and also, I think it, it's important, though, uh, if we might, which is a point I know you very rightly emphasised, is to bring home both to the department and to NHS England that taking on HE's functions involves taking on a set of duties which only HEE delivers. They are not shared with the Secretary of State, as is the case with many of NHS England's functions. So there will not be other places to look, as it were, for education and training responsibility going forward. No, uh, thank you, Giles. Um, and could you just say a little bit about the um, <coughs> where we're at in terms of the regulations and the passage yes, the through the Parliament? So um, I, the Department, as I understand it, is aiming to have um, got everything sorted out. Uh, we're expecting um, further version uh, this week. It, it hasn't yet turned up. Um, I think the department's only to lay in early February, which will give them two months to get through the, the process of the two debates that in the House of Commons, House of Laws, they're required to have. As I understand it, NHS Digital is, is going through that process now. Um, the same uh, set of uh, processes, but obviously they are on a tighter time to it because they actually got to get those debates done. Parliament only came back last week and they're aiming to come in at the end of January. So. We have a little more, a little more leeway, I think, than they have. Good job, thank you. Um, Keith, I see you're on the line. I don't want to put you on the spot, and you've no need to say anything if there's nothing to say. But um, uh, just to invite you uh, to make comments if you feel uh, there's anything you need to add. No, I, th I think that um, um, 
I think what we'd like to do is say, say thank you very much to HE and to NHSE colleagues for working so collaboratively. Um, we do appreciate this is difficult process in terms of in terms of both content and actual timing. Timing has always been a huge challenge on this. Um, but yes, we, we we hope to get a a a revised version of the uh, regulations out as soon as possible. Um, we've got a meeting of the DH internal uh, steering group this afternoon, which should hopefully confirm um, position on um, the consultation responses. And after that, we'd be going straight to coming back to HE and NHSE as soon as possible after that. And there's lot, there's there's lots of uh, lots of detail in the NHSE response as uh, as Giles alluded to. Um, I thought his phrasing was masterly actually when it came to that. <laughs> um, uh, Keith, thanks very much for that. Um, um, right, let me throw it open with having drawn out those points about VR and then just where we are on the regulations. I mean, what everybody around the table that picks up is just how tight this is and just how uh, interdependent each one of these things are to get over the line and sat on top of this is a governance structure, both in NHSE, and we've got our own governance as well, actually in HEA and in the department that needs to be got through as well. So um, this is a very... Um, uh, important area where we're going to need to actually just keep very very focused on delivering to these timelines so um, lots of pressure I think floating around so let me let, let me open in your mark please yeah I mean it's it's more I suppose a focus externally around our partners so one of the questions for me around this process is ensuring continuity particularly with the various sectors that we operate in both in HE and FE to ensure that the they are clear on on the routes into the new decision making functions. I think that's quite important. Um, the other is uh, other issue for me is around students, learners, and trainees because, of course, it should be seamless for them. And I'm, I'm rather hoping they just they they transfer across into their programs and they think, well, you know, what what is HE done? But actually, we have done a great deal with our students, learners, and trainees. So the question for me is around: Do we still need to put? A little bit of um, comms into the system to ensure they understand what the new arrangements will be. I'm thinking primarily about some of our medical teams, so they're they're very clear on what these arrangements mean for for them, their training and their support in the future, particularly around the recreation of the workforce training and education function is going to be a key pivot point. And and so I'm keen to kind of understand that a little bit more in terms of what our thoughts are on how we would do both. I think it's a really important point, actually, Mark. I was at the um, Public Advisory Forum last week, and um, it was interesting. Many of the people who are members of that forum um, wanted to know what was going on, and uh, they wanted the detail. And they are ambassadors for the organisation going out, and uh, they sit on all kinds of other groups. And they're, when they turn up on plus boards and in other places, they're asked what's going on. And actually giving people that basic narrative, I think, as we go through this next um, short period, and I think your point about partners, uh, tra um, uh, trainee students and uh, learners is, is quite important. And I wonder, Lee, whether the team could give a bit of thought to just how we message this over this next period of time. Right, I'll come back. Philip, you can have the last word in this. So let me let me go around and, and collect. So I preach uh, and then John and then Soraya. Just a question on the risks, obviously tight timeline and the marks picked up, the stakeholder engagement. Do you think there's any other risks that uh, could derail some of this or, or could prolong it or make something that we're not aware of? Um so if we separate it out, in terms of the risks of transfer for our staff, it's it's not, a strictly speaking, a duty transfer as such. So we shouldn't have the risks that I would have had previously when I've done these things where you could have missed somebody off a payroll, for example. We won't have those sorts of risks, which I think are really important and really helpful. Um, so I think from that, from that transfer bit, I think we should be OK. Um, I think there are risks around... Um, Getting, getting the complexity of the messages across 
because there are a number of things um, things there. And, and I think I was just going to come back at, just on that real communication point. There is a detailed communication plan, but the document we will be sharing for consultation is essentially a consultation for redundancy. So we're very aware that we have not gone back to those 300 odd stakeholders that we engaged with, with KPMG at the beginning of the process, asking for feedback, form follows function, you know, all of that. We haven't been able to go back to them and say, this is what it looks like. This is the operating model. This is how it works. We are doing that alongside this consultation document because we feel that even for staff, there needs to be context. You just can't put out a numbers thing. There has to be context. We have to be able to describe the interrelationship between subdirectorates, the national team, and beyond. It may not be perfect, but we will describe that and it will be published. So even though it's an individual consultation, it will be published. So we do need a comms plan around our stakeholders who might think we're engaging with them when in fact we're actually doing a very specific legal consultation. So we've got those questions on a comms plan and it's something that Lee and I are going to sort of just thrash out about because that's kind of core business, which is probably Lee's domain. But it is really important to get the nuances of those messages and be able to pick up stakeholder feedback, even though, strictly speaking, this isn't a stakeholder consultation. So, again, it's another process. There's a, uh, a consultation which is essentially about redundancy. Yeah. And this part of the conversation is about how we communicate with people, mm -hmm. what we've done with their previous comments and how yeah. we're proposing to move forward. Yeah. And that needs to go to stakeholders, learners and key yeah. partners. Yeah. yeah. Right, I'm coming round. John. Um, just picking up Mark's point, really. So at the audit committee, very helpful input from Ingrid about the sort of legal standing of the contracts that we've got, the processes, the transition. It's not a, a formal novation of contracts. Contracts will continue with stakeholders. And, but I think the stakeholders need to be told this. Absolutely. Because yeah. at the moment, you know, I, I'm a recipient. I have nothing. Yeah. As a stakeholder, I've received nothing that tells you what's happening with any of the contracts I'm running or anything, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and, and that isn't, you know, that, that yeah, would be no, something absolutely. which is very simple, I think very simple to do, but something we might just overlook. And my understanding is, and we, we, you know, if that is the day one readiness, so NHS England will need to pick that up and they will need to be contacting people around exactly what you've said. So that is part of that work stream. I'll double check the time balance, but that is part of that, yeah. But just to underscore John's point, many other organisations will be planning their budgets for 23 24, which is why this is critical yeah, to know absolutely. whether these are. So I think we can probably say, it, can't we? Contracts will transfer. Yeah, I mean, as I think that's right, Ingrid's absolutely right. We don't have to do the, the legal novation. They will just transfer, which is why we've listed all of the contracts. They will move over to the database and they will be paid for NHS England. I think we can say that, but I think you're absolutely right. There needs to be a formal letter. They've got the list. We've done the due diligence. Let's get it out there. So I'll take that back. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, right. Um, Philippa, can I just ask more specifically, because of the tightness of the time scale, what specific support will give staff if they um, are thinking? go forward for voluntary redundancy. Yeah, I think the two pronged, I mean, one may be, yes, I'm thinking about it. Then, of course, the consultation and the structures come out. I either will or I won't. So what specific support are we going to give staff? Is it a, yeah, I'll give that to the helpline or to the key. something? <laughs> yeah, so there'll be some HEE specific support. So we're, we're trying to prepare line managers because we know that, that that's where the trust sits. There's also been some detailed briefing with their HR business partner community and, and um, uh, there's going to be a, 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 an HEE specific um, line for queries. And in addition to that, NHSE are setting up centrally some support uh, and a central uh, body to take queries to support people who, who are, um, yes, yeah, say, want more, more detail or are unsure of the situation. We can't really give people advice. I'm clear. I know it's an obvious point, but um, so this involves finances. We have to be very clear what we can advise on and what we can't. But there will be support HEB side and trilaterally. Sorry. The People Committee have looked at this, haven't they? Yeah. Uh, think yeah. Yeah. There's a pretty good uh, package, I think, yeah. of things that are available if people want to use. Andrew. 
Thank you. Um, two quick questions. Uh, one, it, I'd be interested to know of the major, not the detail, but the major, any major things or worrying things that have moved from the day one readiness to day two plus readiness. So is there anything there that's making us, um, the, you know, what are the highlights there? And the other one is to pick up a bit of the point that both you know, Mark and John have made about, and I, and I see there's something else elsewhere in the papers around this, but making sure that everything looks right, running it through from the point of view of our learners and our stakeholders. I mean, even little things, the fact that our stakeholders will probably now be getting, even if they still get the contract, they'll be getting from a different bank account, you know, which might cause them to change their processes. Have we have we worked it through from their point of view as well as from our internal point of view? Yeah, that is, um, and I think we're lucky that digital have gone first because that's a lot that's been picked up in the minimum yeah. day one readiness. So yes, I'm I'm confident that Miranda Carter, who came to the audit committee, and others yeah. have got that map through, and they did it fairly recently when Public Health England moved in as well. So they've got quite a lot of experience of that. Um, I think but the, the learners are a bit different for us. The we have the learners and they're not used to, you know, NHSE is not used to dealing with learners, I yeah. suppose. That's a category that's a very different category. Yeah, and a lot of those learners are supported out through regions, which yeah. is a different time scale as well. So um, it's, a, it's a fair challenge and we'll double check that we've picked all that up through mm -hmm. comms, yeah, um, because we've got, you know, we've got all sorts of things out, out there. So we do need to make sure that's supported. Um, it's, it's an interesting one about the the support to staff and the day two readiness. Um, because another risk of the VR is that if, if it's targeted at areas of, of seniority or different businesses, some of the people we might be relying upon for support, for others, um, may, may, be, may be gone quite quickly. So there is something about that day two, as you say, if we're transferring and then we begin the implementation program, we need to be really strong on who the new line managers are or who's going to provide that support if there isn't a line manager mm -hmm. because some of the support will have gone. Mm -hmm. um, and even for corporate colleagues, they'll be moving to different line managers. So there's quite a lot of that to map through. So I think I think it's a really it's a really fair challenge. It's in our it's in our kind of thinking, but I don't think I've thought enough about the risks of us now potentially having gaps. Yeah. at quite a critical time for the right reasons yeah. but we need to as we as we go through that process we need to be clear about where those gaps are and who might need to be picked up with support and in different places so yeah that's a, that's a good point yeah Harpy, were you signaling Did, uh, no, no. 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 <laughs> okay uh any more on this yeah, yeah I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm joining at the end so you may have already said this but i think what's really important is sharing with you um the what we're going to do in terms of the structure and anything else. But then I think that we are moving now to thinking about how, um, and that will involve the kinds of conversations we have with people who are affected, um, who may or may not be, be staying with us in the new organisation, and you know how we actually will have discussions with them about uh, perhaps supporting us through the transition. Um, so post-transition uh, work is kind of becoming higher on, the, on our priority for how we create the new organisation. Okay. Anybody else wants to come in on this? Uh, Philippa, thank you. Uh, Vicky, um, Giles, thanks uh, for the report. Um, I think we're reaching the state of uh, maximum impact of the transition, where um, the questions that staff ask at times like this is, what will happen to me? Where will I be? Uh, now reaching the zenith, quite frankly. So um, the leadership challenge, I think, of managing that transition and the anxieties that surround that, uh, together with people that have their own anxieties, is the leadership challenge. So um, thanks to executive colleagues for uh, the work that you've done. And uh, my ask is if you continue to do what you've been doing as we get to the finish line uh, for this. Um, We'll touch on it, but the um, listening programme, I read through all those papers again in preparation for this meeting. And I'll say this again, but quite remarkable survey results, quite frankly, quite remarkable. Uh, and that's testimony to your leadership, um, but also uh, that of your colleagues throughout the organisation in ensuring that um, morale is there. And just to go back to Andrew George's report back from the performance, um, committee that um, we're on track to deliver 
uh, against those um, uh, objectives that we set at the beginning of this financial year uh, for this year as well, which is, um, I have to say, uh, very, very impressive. So thank you very much. Um, um, Will you say something about the accommodation move? Because I'm, I'm conscious, uh, just uh, as I got a copy earlier this morning, Rob Smith telling me he'd been in on Saturday packing up. Uh, <laughs> and uh, while all this is going on, there's actually accommodation moves as well. So the destination people are going to be in, in a new organisation. They're going to be in a different office as well. So if you didn't have a degree of difficulty about let's just uh, move organisations, let's throw in, let's move buildings as well. Yeah, so the big one is Stuart House is obviously closing to us um, on 31st of March and being held back to the university. We are in a consultation now with um, the regional staff and the corporate staff that are based here. Um, there is a um, transition plan um, and we'll be decanting most of the um, operational floors above by the 28th of February. So there's no further bookings after the 28th of February apart from things already such as the board meeting. Um, and where we need um, facilities, things like recruitments for March, um, arrangements are being made for them to be off-site from this building. Okay. And we've got, um, I think we've had at least 200 forms back from staff, and we've had six queries, so very, very few queries. Um, and the majority of staff have all agreed um, to change the base. So it's going quite smoothly, um, not much anxiety in terms of queries. Say the end of February, we should pretty much be done. And where's the base that you're going to transfer to? This is all down Canary Wharf, isn't it? So the kind of government hub that yes. exists there, which will co locate them alongside the NHC. There'll be a few staff going to Wellington House, but the majority go to Canary Wharf. Okay, David, thank you for that. Um, uh, are we done? Do you want the last word, Philippa, on this? No, 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 you were just, just twiddling your hair away rather than trying to get it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's move on. I'll leave like you and come back to the private meeting. <laughs> okay, well, it's welcome to stay. Uh, um, <laughs> Let's come on then to item eight, which is framework 15 and the long term work for strategy. Barney, come on, Bruce, come up to the table and um, take a look at the seat. Yes, thank you. It's a long way down. It's a warm for you. Thank you, I'll be back. Sounded like a threat. All of the S, Barney, welcome. Uh, Sure, I'm not sure how you plan to do this, but it's only Can I just say a few words of introduction and then can. hand over to Joe and Barney? Yeah. Um, so um, um, just just to set the set the scene, we wanted to give the board in public an update on um, how the how HEE is um, working. Framework 15 and the long term workforce plan are working together. Uh, in the space of workforce planning. Uh, just to remind us in the context of the uh, new NHS England brings new opportunities to embed workforce training education at the heart. This is a promise that we received from, um, from our colleagues in NHS England. And I have to say, um, the last year or so, it has felt that, that we are definitely working in uh, that direction. There's been a lot of work going on. Um, we will soon be um, integrated and it gives us a real opportunity to bring uh, align finance, service and workforce planning, allowing us to pull all of our levers at all levels to deliver improvement in retention, domestic supply, ethical overseas recruitment um, and education and training being at the centre of this. Um, and, and, you know, when we um, started thinking about the transition and the merger to the creation of New NHS England, we talked about being better than the sum of its parts and providing something that was um, you know, would give people that we serve something even better. And um, I feel fairly confident that this work especially is going in that direction. And I don't need to tell the board there's a lot of interest in terms of workforce and workforce planning and development. And uh, Barney and Joe will say a little bit more about that. Um, I do want to take this opportunity, though, to just remind us. I'm not going to go through a list. I have a list here, but I'm not going to go through it. So you've got I know, I have got a list because I think it's phenomenal and we haven't got time. But it would be really good for... For us to remind ourselves of all the achievements in the last 10 years of HEE's work in terms of the growing growing of the workforce, despite some of the constraints that we've been under. 
um, as an as an organisation. So I think we should be really proud of that in so many different areas, and also be in collaboration with our partners. Um, and you know, we talk a lot about being a convener. Um, and in the last 10 years, with whether it's with colleges, with higher education, with regulators, with the department, with NHS England, with providers, um, that's that's a piece of work that I, I know that we will carry forward as we uh, go into the new organisation and we'll build upon it. Um, I think our recent work on Framework 15 is a really good example of how we've built on other pieces of work that we've done before, like Future Doctor, and we've really taken it to another level. I know it's not published yet, but, you know, we're slowly getting to thinking about how it can, uh, at this stage, be helpful to support uh, long-term workforce planning. Um, and then, of course, we've got the long-term workforce plan itself, which is a collaborative piece of work over this last year, um, led by Barney, um, which is uh, um, uh, between us and NHS England. Um, and that's really taking shape and, and doing really well. So what we thought we would want to do today was really um, share with the board um, where we've got to, but also what we think uh, we need to make sure we take forward into the new organisation, uh, the skills and expertise and that sort of convening um, uh, uh, ability to the new organisation um, and also get some feedback from the board on what you think we ought to be uh, focusing on uh, uh, and this is a, it changes up to the minute uh, so I think you know we will hear uh, where we are right up to last week on the on long-term work. Okay. Um. So I don't think we need to present the slides on the basis we've had them before. Um, but these, ones, these, yeah. But I wouldn't mind if you just bring us up to date on where you are with Framework 15. And Barney, if I can then come to you and you can tell us where you are on the long-term workforce plan. I think the last time you joined us, I think was in the private session and you took us through some of the detail. This is a public session, so clearly this is work in progress. But if you could tell us what the kind of process is, as you think. I, I, I think both pieces of work, Joe and Barney, are, are absolutely tremendous. I think they're excellent. But um, given this is a public session, um, uh, it's not our job today to publish uh, either of those documents, although, Joe, you've been very open on the road shows, I think, about content. Um, Barney, you're not in that position yet, so uh, I think we just need to respect that. But um, So some of this, by definition, I think, Davina, will be about process. What are we going to do next now we're going to get there? But uh, if, I, if I do it in that order, um, Joe, do you just want to say where you're up to and... Uh, I, do. I think you do have slides going forward. Uh, uh, yeah, I do. I was going to talk about some of the key messages coming out and just to sort of how we make sure that we align those with long-term workforce plans. So how, how long do I have? Because that's what I was planning to do, just to give a high-level summary. Of the, We've the got half an hour for this item, so yeah. um, as I got okay. it. But I, what I don't want to do is repeat the conversations yeah. that we've had here. So this has got to be, we've got to bank those and take them as uh, agreed and then uh, work out what the next steps are. All right. Okay. Um, so, as you know, so, so since we spoke last, as you know, we concluded the work in the summer and what we've been doing is sharing and testing out the key messages with each of the seven regions. We've had conversations with the health education institutes, the, the providers, the, 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 the new forming ICBs. And I have to say we were quite hesitant at first because obviously this is probably the most pressured time it was ever known. In, in the health and social care sector. So going to talk to people about the next 15 years, I did sort of feel very apologetic and apprehensive going in, but actually the response was was, was incredible. And I know I would say that, but, 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 it, but it really was. I think the work that we shared with people, the opportunity to sort of people to lift their heads up above the current, the current situation and think about actually what's our purpose? What is it that we're trying to do? What is it that patients and users carers want from the service? What is it that our staff and our trainees who will be, uh, who are our future staff, what do they want from the, from the world of the work? And what does that mean? So as we quite rightly focus on recovery and the work that Barn is leading on, on the actions we need to take over the next five years to recover and build the workforce, what, what's the direction of travel that, that we're heading in? What, what are actually we trying to do? And bring it together social care colleagues, because the framework for doing with social care, and also the HEIs. Uh, the, and that's, so so the, the conversation, as, it, as it's been true all the way through this process, has been so invaluable. So then we talk about this being a report, and we talk about the merger. We wanted to talk to today to remind, to remind ourselves, this needs to an end. This is a programme of change and transformation that we shouldn't carry on. 
but how we uh, keep our, our focus on that. So when we spoke, we, we did the, the seven region um, uh, uh, sessions about, about two hours each. And what we did, we took people through uh, the necessity of planning for the long term because it can take up to 15 years to train a consultant. That uh, always a powerful reminder. Also reminding people where were you 2008? It sounds a long time, 15 years, but actually we could all remember where we were in the system not that long ago. We, when, when, when you think back in decisions we all take, so the decisions we take now will affect the long term going forward. We set out the current shape of the workforce where you can see that, as you know, we have grown the workforce, but demand is growing faster than supply. And that growth is located in the acute sector, in reactive Ill, Ill health management rather than prevention rather than cure. And all the facts and figures that people find um, really powerful about that. And we found that in the regions, people really resonated with the need to focus on on demand management. We talk a lot about supply actions and the, the, the benefit of Initiative England is that we can bring together all our different supply levers, but actually the big message that everyone did latch on is the need to get a handle on demand, you know, disease prevention, health creation. So you've got the slide, so I won't talk um, through all of those, but we did test out, you remember last time we spoke to you, we said that given when you look at um, the demographic changes, the uh, impact of IT, digital AI, which our surgical colleagues is a great report on the agenda, absolutely aligns and reinforces uh, what we're saying here. When you take all that together, given that we don't know the future, in the short term, where would we invest? Um, where would we argue we need to invest more? What type of characteristics? Do we need to invest in? And we spoke about the pluripotential workforce last time that, that we meant. And by that, we mean nurses, nurse association uh, associates, physician associates, advanced clinical practitioners, AHPs, all those roles that, that perform a, a really valuable role in themselves. But they're also by nature very flexible, very adaptable. They work across mental, physical health, acute primary care, people's health, <laughs> health and social care. And they're not just really valuable current jobs. Many of those people, if they want to, are the future supply for more advanced roles because they have the ability to continue to grow skills. So that's a sort of, we, we, uh, and, and include um, job school specialist training in that. So these, they ha they already have the characteristics of the future workforce that we want to create. Um, and so because of that, we what we were saying to the system was, when in doubt, to invest in those types of um, people with those sorts of characteristics, that is a, a, a high benefit, low risk uh, move, that you are always going to need people with those skills and those types of roles. They can move anywhere across the system, wherever the activity is, and can be reskilled re quite quickly. And, the, and, and people we spoke to, they really latched onto that, like that's something they can do something about. And we also gave people um, five key actions that we can take now whilst we're waiting for um, uh, other national decisions or funding or, or for um, any kind of light into the tunnel. What we sort of stress to people is that the most important thing we need to do is keep the people that we have. That's the most important lever. You only get net growth, as Rob has taught me over many years, if more people join the service than leave. It's no good point to get how many people you've employed if you've got more people going out your door. So the figure we created to people is that if we can return the current um, lever nursing rate, um, the average lever rate, to 1920 levels, then we'd have 7,000 more nurses in the workforce by 2025, rising to over 30,000 by 2037. That is something that is within the services gift now. And I know there's a really difficult climate to do this in. So it matters how we talk about people, how we talk with them, how we treat them. So I, you know, we really hammered that home to people and people welcome that. Develop them further. So our current existing staff, our best investment for the future is to develop their skills um, and their talents. And that will actually help with that first one in terms of retention. So those two are sort of a, a virtuous two sides of the same coin. As we've just said, significantly grow that pluripotential generalist workforce. Again, all the work that Wendy and her team have led on, 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 on the generalist workforce, those, those, those roles that have many different uses or pluripotential, if you like, and the bit of alliteration like me, that's what we need to focus on. Creating new routes into local careers and caring. So all the, we had lots of examples around the country about um, uh, you know, new, new training care academies, digital global platforms, Patrick's team, 
are leading whole new ways in that we that we did in COVID, so that people can learn in very uh, different ways, reaching out to our local populations, because we'll have a bull from the 18 year old, 18 to 25 year old population that we won't see for the rest of the century. So again, we stress to the system, this is your opportunity to take your local population, which is some ICB um, chief executive. So that's probably the most important lever that we have as, as the NHS to, to offer good jobs to local people that will actually improve health and the local economy. And the last message we left people with was develop shared solutions to shared problems, not what Peter pay for. Health and social care are in this hand and glove and we and as our HEIs and we need to work together to uh, identify the challenges but also the opportunities and to spend on the workforce whether in health or social care as an investment in human capital that contributes to wider economic health and benefits the local population with us as sort of anchor institutions. So we concluded all um, the, those seven and um, what we agreed with two of them is that we'll take our framework and pilot it to try and then create sort of more locally place based because ICBs are ICBs and now task for developing their five year strategies and their, and their joint forward plans with local authorities. So what we want to do now in the North and the Midlands is say, can we take the framework, which is national aggregate data, and it everywhere, everyone obviously has a sensitive population, and say, can we take that learning? So you don't have to do all the all the clever stuff that we did over the past year of 18 months and apply that to your local area, your local places. Is this useful? All the different tools and data that, that we've got between ourselves and skills for care. And, and what are your problems in camp? Is this helpful uh, as a framework? And to live test it as they develop their five year strategies over the next couple of months. So they you sharing that learning with the other ICBs and indeed with us nationally. So as we create the new organisation, again, a reminder that we're there to support the system, to support users and staff. So testing it at all those levels before we start generating lots of new tools and Excel sheets. And you can imagine what we're about to do to the system if we're not careful <laughs> to make sure actually what is it that people actually need, what actually will help them drive change, not get money, not tick a box, not put in a form, but drive the improvements that we urgently um, need. And, and finally, as you'll say, because Rob would shoot me if I didn't, um, this is also our opportunity to integrate workforce planning with service planning and finance planning, because that's the way that we achieve change in an iterative way. So this is our framework 15. It's feeding into the long-term workforce plans that Barney, we've, we've, we've worked you know, really closely over the past six months or so, so that we can connect the short-term actions with the medium-term actions and the long-term sense of direction. That direction may change as facts change. So we'll keep it live, we'll keep it under review, but the prior from this is that we create, uh, this becomes the core business of the new organisation, this way of thinking, so not a separate framework 15 and a pack of slides and Barney's slides, it's actually what we're trying to do to create a new way of integrated planning, or well, planning process as a means to an end to decisions that drive the change that we know that we need. So I'll Very end good. there. But yeah, no, thanks. Uh, Barney. <clears throat> thank, thank you, David. Good morning, everybody. I'm Barney Levers, and I'm the director of the Long Term Workforce Plan. For anybody who doesn't know me, I'm working across Health Education England and NHS England, which I think is a uh, quite important point in really signalling the, the um, direction of travel in terms of how uh, the two organisations have been coming together. And I think, and I hope, the Long Term Workforce Plan is going to be one of the um, first, you know, fruits of. Um, of, of, of our organisations uh, coming together, um, uh, even if we manage to, as I hope, get it out, um, uh, if not before the uh, merger is complete, very, very close to that date. Uh, so, as you've heard, what we're doing in the long term workforce plan is sort of taking the excellent work that's gone into Framework 15, um, and in fact, all the engagement that went into that with um, many people across the system, but also the people plan as well. Um, we're not starting from scratch, and then uh, effectively trying to answer the question, uh, you know, what what is the demand for the NHS workforce over the next 15 years and how might we go about supplying that? And we talked a little bit about that, as David said, when I was last here. Um, and so we're trying to answer those questions about how do we close the current shortfalls in, in staffing? How do we reduce our dependency on international and agency staff? Uh, how do we improve retention? How do we ensure that uh, services are set up so staff can be used as effectively as possible? Um, and we're not 
it, we're not trying to therefore rewrite the strategy or rewrite framework 15 at all. We're trying to build on the back of that and effectively say, well, what is a reasonable basis upon which to make decisions about workforce planning um, in the here and now? And that's why we're taking a 15 year look, not because we feel like we've got some crystal ball that gives us a perfect um, <clears throat> line of sight to what, what exactly what we'll need in 15 years, but because we need to have a reasonable basis of, of the long term so that we can make good decisions now about workforce planning. And that's really what the long term workforce plan is about, is about what decisions do we need to take now? Um, uh, where do we think we should be putting investment in? Where do we think we should put our efforts in? What do we think are the key actions for, you know, for for systems, for employers, um, uh, for staff themselves to an extent, but also obviously for NHS England nationally, regionally, um, and health education England as we come together, and also for the government, for regulators um, and the like. And that's what we're um, uh, trying to set out in the plan. Um, and the good news is the government has committed to publishing uh, the long-term workforce plan this spring. Um, so, uh, but we we're already kind of well advanced and we were working to um, a, a deadline for the end of the last the calendar year just gone and we more or less stuck to that. So we were able to um, provide government with the complete plan just before Christmas and uh, so conversations with government are live and continuing and there are more happening this week. And the government alongside uh, committing to publishing it this spring have um, signal that they want the forecasts or as I prefer to call them the projections in the plan um, independently validated and so we're still waiting for confirmation of what that process will look like and um, if I wanted to flag a risk the, the fact that we haven't yet had confirmation of what an independent validation process will look like is probably one of the most significant risks to the timetable um, but we're really ready to welcome um, uh, that kind of scrutiny. We think it would be um, good for the credibility of the plan if, uh, you know, our stakeholders, um, uh, but also Parliament has uh, credit, you, you know, has, feels like there's credibility behind what we're doing. And therefore, um, the, the actions we're suggesting are kind of, uh, you know, have have that, that validity. And we've done a lot of engagement ourselves uh, with, you know, trade unions, with uh, um, the Royal Colleges, with think tanks uh, and um, voluntary sector um, health system. So and, and to inform and test some of our um, assumptions and thinking. So we're um, very willing to kind of uh, continue that process through an independent validation um, with the government. Uh, and I mean, I'm not going to talk a huge amount about uh, conclusions, but I would just note that if uh, any of you happened to pick up a copy of The Times on Saturday, you'll have seen an interview with Amanda Pritchard, Chief Executive of NHS England, uh, talking about some of her thoughts and what, what, you know, what's coming, emerging in the long-term workforce plan. And, uh, you know, it's very clear, I think, as we all know, that we, we need more staff. Uh, we need to train more in the UK. Uh, we need to broaden routes into training for apprenticeships. Um, and we need to enable staff to be able to work differently to sh as we shape services around patients um, and you know use ICSs and ICBs to, to, to transform how we're operating. And I think a lot of that came through um, in, in that interview uh, as given as part of the Times Health Commission um, kicking that off. <coughs> and I think that's what the long-term workforce plan will 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 be saying. Um, but just just to touch on. Navina's point about how does this then, how do we take this into the new organisation? Well, we, I, I think we're really clear um, that this is an iterative process. Well, this isn't a one-off, um, you know, one-shot game where we do this and sit back. We expect to um, repeat workforce planning, you know, on a regular basis alongside the NHS planning round. So sort of looking at it every year to, to refine our assumptions and inform the actions that we're taking because we don't as i said we don't have a perfect crystal ball so um we want to establish as business as usual and as um we're talking about structures and uh, thinking about how we align the, you know um how we're organized nationally um we're, we're thinking about that but also we we need to bring in um, into future rounds much more closely to the local planning. So what ICS is and ICB is doing and how does that inform then uh, workforce planning and the, the actions being taken at different levels. Excellent. Thank you, uh, um, Barney uh, and Joel. So uh, in my musings over the weekend, I discovered that um, the Swedish government have a futures ministry 
it's a meeting where there's a minister whose job is to take a strategic perspective on a whole raft of issues. And when they gather, it's chaired by the Prime Minister of Sweden. And I thought, actually, if you want to reinforce why getting beyond today's operational requirements are necessary uh, to the point about the long-term plan, I thought that was a really interesting uh, piece of learning to take from, um, from another government. But um, uh, let's open it up. Um, thank you both for the contribution you've made and just, um, you know, stretching us into thinking what are the next steps and how do we move forward? Joe, in the very immediate term, as you've uh, set out, and then Barney um, taking that longer term view. But you've both touched on how we bridge from where we are to where we need to be to deliver this objective of integrated planning. Um, so, uh, Andrew, please. So this is absolutely fantastic stuff, best stuff I've seen in 40 years in the health service in terms of trying to get a fix on the future. Um, I think we have to support the ICBs and they're all at various levels of maturity. But for me, the success of this can only be driven by the ICBs because they have the linkages to all the academic institutions in the patch, all of the providers in the patch, the links with social care. So I don't. I, our job essentially is to let go and let these guys do their work, and it's the, it's going to be the big acid test of whether an ICB is is a concept is successful or not, in my opinion. Um, however, our launching point is probably the weakest we have seen for several decades, i.e. we've got a vacancy rate of around 11%. Pre-pandemic, it was 6%. And when you're employing 1.3 million people, that's a lot of people um, that you're having to cover with agency and other staffing. And I'm not sure we're doing enough around supporting providers on the whole retention agenda and what's a good employer because you know, my limited experience in this is all about you know this is led by good leadership and if your organization is well led people want to work there they want to participate they want to grow as individuals and i don't think we've got that and okay we were in a really dire position you know this winter with places gridlocked but I don't think we've allowed local leaderships to flourish in the way that they possibly can. And I think it's incumbent on the centre, HEE and NHS England, to do a lot more around the attention, the retention agenda and supporting organisations. If we are not successful on this, our vacancy rate will continue to climb and we'll be seeing 15%. And all of our money will get washed into the whole agency spend and temporary staffing malaise, which you know we want to avoid like play. So that's my big caveat with this, David. Uh, Andrew, thanks. And um, um, I think those, uh, Joe and uh, Barney, I, I, I think taking the uh, best thing I've seen in 40 years is not, um, you know, it's pretty significant coming from somebody with Andrew's pedigree. Um, but Andrew, I think we can have another go at this later in the week at the People and Nominations yeah. Committee and um, uh, NHSE where we're both uh, in that meeting and we can have another go on this issue about retention. Joe, your figure of if we go back to 2019 levels yeah. of retention, we get 7,000 more nurses. It's a very powerful figure, it strikes me. And an even bigger figure when you go further into the future. So, um, Right, uh, Soraya, and then I'll come to you, Andrew. Um, can I just build on um, on the discussion about the ICBs really being in the, um, the driving seat for this and actually utilising the data? I just wondered what support the centre would actually give them in the context, these, the, the documents and both pages, the framework 15 and the long-term workforce plan is really good, but just the mechanics of actually giving them local information, local data in a digestible form to then re for them to really then utilise their local connections to build on that. Has What sort of processes are, um, have been thought through? Because it'd be so disappointing if these this sort of um, information just sat as, yes, a board has received the report, but actually the next steps, but supporting them to take it forward. Yeah, go on, Phil. 
Yes, so we developed the report with the idea that, that they would have tools needed. So for each of those five key actions, you've got a set of tools and data that, that links to people. So it's a, the HEF data, Skills for Care got really good data, but it broken down to every ICB level. So the data that we collect, we can say to people, so, so for example, we might say that, 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 that nationally, uh, so, or, or saying Cornwall, this is a national figure, but saying Cornwall, we know that um, over 80, you will have a third of your population will be aged over 85 by 2037. You go from a quarter to a third of your population, but in the northeast, that will go from a fifth um, to a quarter. So we've got regional cuts of all, we've got like a national story, and then what that means, uh, both regionally, but also at ICB level. So we can start to say, think about actually, this is your current resource. So, you know, so for example, if you take Birmingham, so the whole ICB, they've got 80,000 staff working in health and social care. Try and start from, this is your current resource. This is what you've got. This is your current vacancy rate. Uh, what, what is your current demand like? So we're using the approach that we've got, the national store, we're actually been trying to play through more local and regional data. And then they don't have to do the research to the likely impact of IT, but because we've done that, but trying to apply. So, but then we might think we're being helpful. We've got lots of tools and data, but part of the pilot is to say, actually, is that helpful? And if not, then what is it that you actually need? So uh, my very small team was sort of budding up with some of the ICBs. So when you say we, who in FGE is engaging with the ICBs um, in the way that Soraya has asked? Is it our regional? Well, I would do that anyway. That's our day job. So if our regions were here, you know, that is what they do, the Nigel Burgess of the world, that is their job. And they would seem to do that in the new organisation. Obviously, Rob's team turns the analysis and my team um, in terms of the, the strategy. But what we need to do is work out how we intercept with them in a way that's helpful rather than burdensome. Because a lot more of this is going to get pushed down to ICB, isn't it? Yeah, and what we, yeah, but we need to just, just get it off our dis, de desk and say, oh, that's your job now, ICB. That's why the pilot's so important, actually. What are your challenges? Is this helpful? If not, if that doesn't work, what does? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Barney, do you want to come in on this one? Um, about support well, well no, not, not especially. I mean, I suspect, I see Rob's got his hand up, and I suspect Rob's probably going to, the only point I was going to make is that one of our key ways of engaging with this is through our planning, you know, our regular planning round, and we've, you know, gone went out with planning guidance, obviously, ahead of, of Christmas, which Rob was heavily involved in with yeah. NHS England as well. So I suspect Rob may want to say a bit more about that. But, I, you know, I echo what, what Joe's saying around um, engaging with ICBs. And, um, but I think also you, we've got to reflect that there are certain decisions that need to be taken nationally before really we can kind of um, give the certainty and the clarity to ICBs that they'll be needing. I mean, they need to have an idea about what's coming through and coming down the yeah. pipeline so they yeah. can take it. ICBs can't do medical school places, yeah, for instance. Exactly. They might be able to do things about training those associates. Yeah. But do you want to come in? Yeah, right? there's something really important about providing the right support without a feeling kind of paternalistic audit yeah. for you. Uh, and, yeah. and critically, the key thing about ICBs, and you know, you're absolutely right, is this has to be integrated service workforce and financial planning. If you're saying local workforce planning it doesn't mean anything, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and critically, we can be really good at helping them on the kind of supply side because we've got fantastic data which we do share. The demand has to come from their service plans. You know, we can't we can handle population stuff, we can do the, the Cornwall getting old thing. But fundamentally, it's their service plans that will generate the actual demand over the next X, X period. And they have to own that. And they have to recognise that that demand for staff is a piece of workforce planning that can't sit nationally. You know, we can give them themes and trends. And then you can add it to the really good kind of supply data. Um, and that's the point you, you then centre planning in the, in the system. Yeah, we're not just transitioning here, we're transforming the way we do this stuff, yeah. I think, it's those two things together. Um, I've got Andrew and Mark, but Navina wanted to come in. Uh, Andrew, do you want to go on to another issue, or is it on this? It's connected. It's, it's, go, uh, go on, I'll come to you, because you were next. Then. So I think, I totally agree with all this, and I think the, you know, the ICBs, that's where, that's where a lot of the action's got to be. But somebody who chairs the People's Committee for an NHS Trust, you know, we're seeing... We, you know, we're putting. We you know we have a strategy. The ICB. We have two ICBs. We report to. They've got their strategy. It's not actually clear who's responsible for what people. And there's a danger of either turf wars or gaps between them. And I think anything that can help. What is the most appropriate level to look at these things? Because in actual practice, for the trust has a lot of bullet point one. Yeah. Not all of it, but a lot of bullet point one is the trust. Problem. But a lot of the other ones are not. And so anything that helps that segmentation, I think, would be helpful. Yeah. Um, 
really good perspective. Uh, Naveena. So I just uh, just to build on the ICB point, and thank you, Andrew, for uh, the the bringing in the trust perspective. There's also the provider collaborative yeah. uh, in there as well, which is really important um, part of this work. Uh, I just wanted to say that already, as part of our transition and the closer working with NHS England. Um, we are making sure that workforce planning is part of the work that NHS England does as it works with regions and ICBs to decide on how we will, we will transition into the new organisation and where different functions will sit across the, the whole pathway. So I think that's just to make sure that HEE board uh, is uh, assured that workforce planning is in the mix for those discussions with our colleagues in NHS England nationally. Um, and, I, and the second point is, I, we are also, of course, waiting to see what the Hewitt Review um, will uh, add to uh, and, and make sure that we um, take those findings into account as we yeah. plan. Thanks for Andrew's point about segmentation. Yes. I think. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's three sub points out of the main one, which is, well, is, the, the, is the elephant in the room around the money. Um, and, and I suppose there are three elements to this before you think oh, I'm just going to want to go and get to the Treasury, which is the first is our current spend, which is our sunk cost in the national thing. The question for me is very much around what is the national spend in light of all of these changes and therefore what is the maximisation or efficiency angle that we need to take in terms of where do we deploy the resource for maximal impact? I think that's a key question, particularly as we transfer into NHS England. The second is the, is the growth funding requirements. It's fairly evident that more is going to cost someone some money. So we kind of have to think about, and I'm sure, Barney, you've got that all covered in as part of the plan development. And, and there's the spot there. It's all yeah. covered, is it? You've been told the checks in the A wise, a wise <laughs> nod from Barney. Uh, um, and the final one is provider spend. And I, I mean broadly provider and ICB, which is that the elements around retention as an example around being a good employer mean that we do have considerable costs within the system that, that can be maximised and leverage. I'm not suggesting for an instant there might need, not need to be tweaks on that, but education, training and retention within provider needs to be seen on the same landscape. And that's why the budget yeah, does give us that, because you actually then start to see provider system national versus growth opportunities within the same financial envelope. But I'm not underestimating at all the financial headwinds that we're going to expect around the, the, the growth potential, particularly over the next two to five years. Okay. Very good. And I think if I remember correctly, the planning guidance for next year did talk about real terms growth in relation to the investments in education and training as well, which um, um, I, I thought was a very significant statement coming out from um, NHS England about ambition and intention. Uh, high proof. I just had two points. Um, firstly, it was around how can we build a bit more flex into the system. If I go back even six or seven years, looking at the five or four view long term plan, you know, we weren't envisaging such a big waiting list in 22, 23. We weren't thinking what the impact of Brexit might be or the pandemic might be. And if I look the next 10 years, there might be threats like this that may come about that we may not know about. And if we were to paint an optimistic scenario, do we have a good understanding of how much more would we need to go on top of that so we can build a flex into it rather than it being purely like for like in terms of numbers? So that's kind of the first point. The second is, do we have a good view on are we allocating our roles in the right way? And, and what I mean by that is, if I look at the benefits of the ARS scheme in primary care, we've had two pharmacists recently join us in general practice primary care setting. And both of them are doing work way above what they've done in a hospital setting. And in fact, so much so that they don't want to work in the hospital again. They want to work in a primary care setting because they get to interact with patients, they do reviews, they do long-term chronic management versus mainly doing dispensing of medicines in the hospital setting. Mm. So what that goes to tell me is that are we effectively using our workforce in a way that's actually bringing the best out of them, but at the same time optimising the work they do? And I think that will play a really important role as we think about the future. If more is focused on prevention, more is focused on primary care, a, is the money going that way? But B, are the roles also going that way? Because that's where it seems like a lot of the individuals today seem to play more benefits. So those were kind of the two points I wanted to bring up. Really helpful perspective. Right, um, I'm going to take uh, the reports as reports in progress. If I distill that whole 40-odd um, minutes, it seems to me that we've set out what needs to be done in Framework 15. You're busy doing that in terms of long-term workforce plan, Barney. Um, that work is still in progress, uh, um, but a lot of this conversation has been about 
not just the transition of the responsibility from HEE to NHSE, but it's been about the transformation that's required in not just what we do, but how we do it. And the segmentation point is who does it as well. And um, interested in your point, uh, Harpreet, um, is I wonder how giving people more fulfilled roles is going to contribute to improving retention and that sense of being able to develop a career as well. So um, lots to go at. Thanks both for the working uh, description of the work that you're currently undertaking work in progress um, and um, lots of government statements say we're working on a long-term plan the uh, weekend media was full of uh, those a dhsc spokesperson said we're working on a long-term plan um, as well as the commitments of the maybe uh, fiscal events etc so um, but let's hope that that's sooner rather than later in the spring and that uh, it can be built into uh, the planning that needs to be done for 23-24. But um, for the minute, thanks to both of you for that contribution. Yeah, OK, can we move on? Uh, Bonnie, you're welcome to stay, but um, given your agenda, I'm sure you've got lots of other things to do. So uh, for now, thank you very much indeed. Um, um, so culture and the best place to work. Uh, Lee, this is yours. Um, I've already touched on uh, just rereading this again. We presented it to the board previously. It's only a short agenda item here. Um, uh, but um, we wanted to make sure it came into a public forum. So by bringing it here today, uh, rather than discussing this privately, we're discussing it publicly. Uh, I've already commented uh, that the levels of engagement and the decrease from last year's to this year is quite remarkable given the fact that we've been going through the degree of organisational change that we've gone through. And um, uh, I, I'm sure I speak for all the non executive directors to. Um, pass on our appreciation to executive colleagues for the leadership that you've demonstrated, but also to leaders and managers throughout the organisation and staff throughout the organisation for the continued focus that they bring uh, in relation to this uh, work. Um, I, I think some of these results are terrific. That isn't to say we're, we're perfect, um, but there's an awful lot of really rich information here. I think there's three themes towards the end which really draw this together, Lee, which actually begin to identify what the focus is. And Mark and myself were just chatting before uh, the meeting started about cultures and uh, uh, how important they are uh, in the future as well, which um, is one of the key themes that is flagged at the end of this. But, but, but Lee, um, I'm not wanting to spill you. This is just your opportunity to put this work into the public domain. Thank you very much, David. And as David says, um, the presentation that I gave to the private board a month ago, so before Christmas, um, was broadly set out what the, the survey did tell us. And um, what you had in your packs this time around was the full report from the supplier. So the full ETS report says far more information and um, delve into that. Um, since I spoke to the board, we have I have presented this to the full organisation um, and to our trade unions as well in a separate meeting and had similar conversations from what we had here about how the results have stood up really well. Um, but obviously that still be just lots of things to work on um, both now and in the future. Um, and so what I propose to do here, David, is not to go through the presentation again, you have seen it, um, but just talk about the three themes that you mentioned and things that are happening in response to that. So we've already had a conversation in um, earlier in the comments in this board, and we'll have another one later, no doubt, around the moving to a new organisation theme, um, which are part of that is about the perception of NHS England, and that continues to be a big issue. Um, colleagues worrying about whether we are really creating a new NHS England that will be different from the current one um, and where we are taking the best of HG with us. Um, and this does recognise that we're not perfect, but there is a real, every time we talk to colleagues, and we have lots of conversations with colleagues about transition, this 
real attachment to how we do things and how we've done things in the last two or three years is really strong. Mm. Um, and so I know I'm having conversations, and I'm sure Vicky is as well as part of the work she's doing with colleagues in, in NHSC and in HSD about how we do bring the best bits of all three organisations together, recognising this is a completely new and different organisation to what we've had before. Um, and we are having conversations with colleagues in both our trade unions, but also with um, our networks around making sure we move the policies. Um, because of all the stuff about culture, all the stuff about the transition, actually the thing that's going to drive whether the new HSE can feel different to the old one and the old HEE and the old HSD is whether we can put into the policies the things that will make a difference to help improve their lives. We're already having conversations about where people work, how they work, about whether we change our paternity policy, all those sorts of areas are all being discussed. Um, and I know Vicky's hard, working hard on that, and we are involving our um, networks in that. And that's networks in three organisations, not just our one, are playing their role. On thing two, the support during transition. Um, again, we had a bit of that conversation this morning, um, and there's a whole raft of work being done, and Vicky's far better place to talk about it in uh, detail than I am, around the health and wellbeing package, around supporting people um, with those who aren't going to stay and those who aren't going to stay, about what they're going to do with their lives, um, how we can best support them to do what they want to do. Because I think there's a thing that we have focused on that perhaps we haven't focused on as much about this transition is lots of people are going to make life choices over the next three months mm -hmm. about what they want to do with the rest of this. It could be a huge change. No one is going to be doing the same thing after April than they're doing before April, whether that's in the new organisation or outside the new organisation. Um, and so how we support them to give them the best information and best support to make those choices, I think, is really important as part of the transition programme. And I focus on individuals and support them as individuals, but also as an organisation. Um, and the third theme was the communications theme. Um, there was lots of pushback in when we first started working as three organisations trying to communicate together um, to all our colleagues um, in the early days of the transition. Um, and the first all staff webinar about it, I think everyone would accept, did not go as well as it could have done. Um, but actually, the change since then had been really noticeable. And colleagues in HE and HSE and HSD all noticed it that we're focusing far more on making sure we tell people what we don't know, but preparing them for when we do know it. And actually, I think this Thursday, for everyone, it's going to be a uh, sort of watershed in terms of getting the information out that people have been working for for a long time um, in a really meaningful way. And so there will be the meaningful updates they talked about. We are moving into transition in, in terms of consultation. But also we've changed how we deliver the communications. Um, we've tried to put things on a single microsite so everybody gets used to working in a single organisation. So all the information for all the organisations is in the same place. You can get it from the same place. And we've updated our Q's and A's far more regularly. I mean, we're running at sort of three and a half thousand questions. Um, and I'm hoping there'll be less this time because of the, the information we're going to impart. So all these things about transition are happening. Um, but I think it's important that we support the people who aren't going to be in the new world as it is, who aren't going to be in the new world. And I think that's a big challenge for us because both of we do know is when we did ask the question, 59% of our staff said they wanted to join the NHSE. That means 41% who don't know or aren't. Um, and those are the choices I'm talking about, how we support people through those. And that's some of the work I think we need to concentrate on over the next few months. Yep, yeah, OK. Uh, thanks. Um, so we've had this before, uh, um, but if there are any points anybody wishes to make, uh, um, but um, please feel free to do so. Sure. I would just add that the, um, it is relatively positive compared to what we've done before. We know there's still problems with colleagues um, who use racism and, and, and sexism, but, but it is so much better than it was. I just think that didn't happen by accident. 
that happened because of deliberate intent driven from the top of the office by yourselves and yourself and part to say as we go into the new organization again we just need to act with intent to keep and build and grow that positive culture because this is not an accident it's just it wasn't the weather that created this improvement yeah. well, it was. but yeah um, so we should recognize that and that forward I'm sure the weather analogy is, uh, <laughs> my brain's gone all over the place at the minute, but... Um, and if I could just add that, that People Committee, that was one of the real um, concerns. We had a really engaging conversation, um, but just to make sure that the momentum, the approach is not lost and that there is actually um, clear visibility to staff that that will continue and that will develop further. Yeah. And it's just really critical. Okay. Look, I think this is terrific work. No, it's not perfect, but um, goodness me, for uh, some of the improvements that are flagged here, let alone the maintenance of an engagement score at a time of massive transition where every single member of the organisation, Barnabina, does not know exactly what they'll be doing next year, is just quite remarkable. So, uh, snatch the victory from the victory. Um, um, but actually, I think it's quite important that we formally send this to colleagues in uh, NHS England as well, because I think this gives a window on some of the comments that HEE staff will be making about their fear of the culture that they're joining. And it gives some um, I think evidence based on the sample size, uh, notwithstanding the 5941 uh, comment, but actually... This is a perception, and I don't think it's for anybody on the board to say this is not true. If it's somebody's perception that this is how it is, then it's that that needs to be managed and, uh, and, and dealt with. So um, I would ask that it is um, formally sent through to colleagues in NHSE um, and picking out some of the points that are actually uh, made. Uh, Lee, thanks for circulating this and uh, for the introduction and thanks for the work. Um, so I've been asked if I could flip the next two agenda items. So we actually go um, with uh, the future of surgical training next, um, because I think one of our colleagues has stepped out of surgery. Come on, guys, come to the table. Um, so... Well, the guys are getting... Can we just shuffle? Uh, There's some chairs. Well, chairs. why don't you bring chairs here to the yeah. top, actually? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, OK. And we've got Charlotte online here, Chris Lynch. Well, let's, and, let's um, just get people to introduce yourself, Patrick, and then you can, uh, you can take your talk. So... Yeah, hi, everybody. I'm Chris Munch. I'm a cardiac surgeon by clinical background. Uh, with a major interest in surgical training. And uh, I've sort of been keeping an eye on surgical training for a while now. And I think the pandemic has demonstrated to us that we need to um, to make some changes, shall we say. And it was, it's been great to be working with uh, the Association of Surgeons in Training who have produced this report, for you, for you, which you're going to see now, um, to see how technology can advance the... Um, the future of surgical training. So we've got Josh Burke and um, Martin Kane from the Association of Surgeons, Surgeons in Training, who are really the sort of owners of this report, and I'm going to share it with you. And Sean. And the second point is that we've got um, the second presentation will be by Charlotte uh, Al Said, who is our robotics uh, research fellow. And we'll talk a little bit about the future of robot assisted surgery and the need for training and education in that area. So that's what I've up for you for okay. the next few minutes. Uh, so I've got 30 minutes for this. So the longer you talk, the less time for discussion. <laughs> uh, self manage this, guys, uh, because I will end it at 12. Sure. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Martin King. I'm the president of the Association of Services and Training. Um, and I'm General Surgery Registrar by background based in Northern Ireland. Just to set a bit of context to ASSET, the Association of Surgeons, we, we represent all surgical trainees in the UK and Republic of Ireland, from medical student up to consultant. So we began in 1976 and we've evolved to a massive organisation in the current day. 
May I also say on behalf of our council and members, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today um, to Health Education England Board. Um, this is a historic day for us to be able to showcase some of the work that we've worked in collaboration with some of your teams. The Future of Surgery Technology Enhanced Surgical Training Reports began in 2019, really at the beginning of the pandemic. As an organisation, we face a time of challenge whereby the opportunities for trainees to participate in activity that would allow them to help provide the care that they need to patients, as well as to become the consultants of the future was extremely difficult. If we can go to the next slide, please, Matt. So as you can see, the context for this began in March 2020 on the left of this graph, where like many services in the healthcare system, lots of activity was hampered because of staff redeployment. But really now in the far right of that, you be can begin to see that with the loss of elective activity, just over 1.7 million in September of 2022, that correlated with trainees having reduced logbook activity. And really, we began to see a worrying trend that unless we began to adjust and augment how we trained, then we were going to lead to an unsustainable system that was both inefficient for those in the system, but ultimately for the future of patient care delivery. So we really wanted to work together with organisations. So we worked with the Joint Committee on Surgical Training, Health Education England, and particularly um, Paul Sadler and Chris Munch. I'm very grateful for Patrick today for bringing this item to the board. And we worked also with the Confederation of Postgraduate Schools, as well as the Royal College of Surgeons of England, who funded the, and supported the bursary for this, as well as the Royal College of Edinburgh and the NIHR. And I want to kind of um, really stress that this is collaborative, and that was the key thing that we found of benefit. But what we identified really is this all um, was coming at a time when there was huge reform already in surgical training. As you can see on the right of that, that refers to the surgical curriculum. And really we're, we're moving from a training process of numbers to competency. And therefore we felt that we are hitting this at a time when proficiency using technology could really be used to facilitate the progression of surgical trainees. And if we can go to the next slide, please, Mark. Now, this slide demonstrates the context to the investment of technology across global healthcare systems. And what you can see is that across the globe, the investment in technology is growing exponentially. However, the implementation and the assessment of its feasibility and application is yet to be kind of advanced. And therefore, there was a precedent now to work together as collaborators in the UK to really understand how we could introduce this technology. The report on the right refers to a previous project in the NHS where 10 billion was used to implement new ICT technology. And one of the criticisms that came from that was the governance and, what, and, the, and the accountability. And we view this today as an opportunity to kind of showcase what we've put together to kind of advance these conversations in a more coherent and structured manner as recommended from that report. The asset logo with the COVID refers to the context though in 2019 when this began, where we had over 70 companies approaching us as an organisation and trainees, all looking and hoping that their products would be the next best thing in the healthcare system. And therefore, in a time of difficult fiscal policy, pressures on trainees and society, really this report sets a precedent as Josh, the chair of the Commission will outline in terms of its methodology, a system of solutions that are both fair, equitable and um, for all, regardless of geography or which hospital that you're in. If we go to the next slide, please. So this really builds on the work that Mr Richard Kerr, who was the chair of the first commission in 2018 at the Royal College of Surgeons of England, it really began to showcase to the profession the use of data, the use of artificial intelligence, genomics, and more personalised care, where the patient has more information, but also the safety and the governance of use of technology would really play a huge role in the future of the profession. And this builds on the work in 2019 from uh, Professor Topple in the review that we need to begin to equip the workforce in the knowledge as well as the skills of the use of technology. Is that fundamentally is important to the patient who will be interacting with you, the clinician? And what Josh will touch on towards the end of his presentation is how we can transfer that in terms of theory into practical integration to tr the training systems that we currently have. And if we go to the next slide. So as you can see, these are the lovely 21 faces from all across the UK. You're a part of the FOSS Test Commission. And we're very grateful for these individuals who many of them are consultants in the NHS, who actually shared both their research as well as their views for cross specialty organisations of all grades and levels. And that was um, curated and shared by Mr. Josh Burke, of whom we'll now outline 
some of the um, solutions and also the methodology for false tests. Over to you, Josh. Thanks, Mark. And um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Josh. I'm an academic color excel trainee doing my PhD at Leeds at the moment and was in Martin's position two years ago. I'm um, the vice chair of the Academy of Trainee Doctors Group, that's the pan speciality representative group for doctors in the UK. Um, next slide, please. So all these people gave up their time for free um, to, to produce this report, which we produced in August. Um, but there was a huge number of hours spent um, deliberating, meeting with people who submitted evidence to the report. Um, and the first two things we noticed right from the off were threefold. Um, the first was that companies were trying to match their solutions to problems which had all of a sudden had a light shone on them because of the pandemic. And we think that paradigm is probably the wrong way around at the moment in the UK. The second one is companies trying to drag and drop interventions which have worked in other countries into the UK training system and it's not quite working. And the third one, particularly with augmented reality, is that the fidelity just isn't quite there yet. Next slide, please. So we have a choice. There's lots of blue sky thinking. There's lots of promotion of um, both individuals and, um, and companies in this space. And actually what we wanted to do was generate a report which was useful for trainees, trainers and policymakers like yourselves for the frontline staff who were, were suffering throughout the pandemic and beyond. Next slide, please. So we approached Health Education England, which kind of gave us access to two um, of your uh, national surveys. One was the Surgical Solutions Survey, which I understand was novel at the time because of the pandemic. And the second one was the Risk Reporting Tool in 2021, which, which put surgical specialties across all, um, all the crafts as second in line for being the most affected, just behind our ophthalmology colleagues. Next slide, please. We combined these with two methodologies, which were novel at the time. So Delphi methodology, which all of you will be aware of, but then hackathon methodology, which engages the end users to generate their own solutions to problems which were identified. We long listed over a thousand problems reported, everyone from medical students to consultants across all the different stakeholder groups and asked people who attended the day over a three day hackathon to rank them in terms of um, priority for unmet needs to where we could potentially find solutions. Next slide, please. What we then did was um, notice that the uh, solutions which are identified and the problems which are identified seem to fit both the patient pathways, all those pinch points along your, your care pathway where there's potential learning to be had, and also the trainee pathway, so the hurdles you have to jump through as a modern trainee in our current NHS education system. What we then did was map them to the capabilities and practice framework, which is our currency really for progression now in our new surgical curriculums. And that was the basis for our structure of the report. Next slide, please. What we wanted to do, and most was in this process, been part of the Kennedy report, which highlighted the bond with diversity at the Royal College of Surgeons of England, was ensure that equality, diversity, sustainability, and the workforce were at the centre of any, everything we recommended. Because without all of those three, we felt anything that we did recommend was probably going to be futile. We went out to a really short submission window because we knew we'd be oversubscribed, and we received 120 submissions over a two week period. These were peer reviewed by the Commission, and um, some of them rewritten, 32 were published along with 11 key consideration articles from key opinion leaders um, in areas where we were perhaps a little bit under submitted from, from the work that we received. We also accepted 10 industry case studies of work which we think is you know, on its way to being able to be um, assessed for its potential to be nationally adopted. We don't think it's quite there yet, but there's potential. Next slide, please. There were five key areas, but I thought today I'd give you four examples, two which are quite bespoke for surgery, but we think are important, and two which are broad and probably affect all specialties. Next slide, please. We came with seven key recommendations. We started off with 63, but everyone told me no one would read them. Um, so actually, the, the juicy stuff and, 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 and the good stuff is actually in the conclusion sections of the executive summary. So if you, if you do have a chance to read it, that's the bit where I, where I suggest you look to. Next slide, please. So the first one um, is about optic video logbooks. And this is linked to what Martha said earlier about proficiency-based training. So at the moment, it's a numbers game. We're, we're judging our progression based on how many operations we've done. Top right is a study we did with ASSET a few years ago, which looked at a thousand trainees and demonstrated that a third of trainees um, fill out their own work based based assessments and they sort of slice them off. A further third have their consultants passwords and sign off their own work based based assessments. And for those of you that are au okay fait with the evidence based work based based assessments, you'll know it's not quite, it's not quite um, rigorous. And so combine that with the findings of that paper, we don't think it's very good. So actually, the ability to record our operation and integrate some of the USPs that these companies listed have to offer is really exciting, particularly because of the change that we've had with the curriculums for proficiency rather than numbers. And I'm working with them to try and explore where and if they could be used. And we're currently working with one of them called Proxmi to try and ascertain some evidence base because at the moment it's very limited with regards to the use um, of um, operative videos to track progression. Next slide, please. So not too much in this because Charlotte will speak about it, but we've published heavily on the lack of access to robotics training. And this often divides opinion 
um, because most trainers and trainers can't deliver basic levels of safe care in lots of their jobs that they're working at the moment. But I'll just leave you with one fact. So the 2019 Bowsus, the Urology Society audit into prostatectomy, demonstrated that 85% of prostates have been done robotically. There isn't one mention of robot in the current urology curriculum, and over a third of people um, have, sorry, a third of urology trainees have only ever touched a robot, and none of them are proficient in it at the time of that. Uh, paper which was three years ago now. Next slide please. So what's the nirvana of a surgical training intervention? Well hopefully it would be you would introduce a training intervention and you get an improved patient outcome but there's next to nothing in the literature to demonstrate that that's possible. There's a couple of things in the emergency laparotomy which demonstrate non-inferiority with a couple of interventions but there isn't really anything that's shown as that improvement. So the next best thing I guess is educational outcomes but in surgery I don't think we're very good at it. We're so far away from educational theorists compared to what's pragmatically happening on the front line, I think there's a lack of collaboration between those two thought processes. And actually a lot of the literature that's out there on education training interventions, it's either bias from conflicts from um, people who are conducting the studies through payment or uh, other disclosures, or they're run by the companies themselves and are often lacking um, in methodological rigor. Next slide, please. So I was reading some of the things which HU published, um, I think Patrick mentioned um, health economics analysis on some of the library services that have been ongoing. And actually what we're seeing nationally is trusts and deaners are investing at a local level in technologies that don't have any efficacy. We've seen sort of you know, the graveyards of laparoscopic box trainers, the, uh, the VR uh, rooms where trainers can't get to them because actually the road staff staffed enough to be able to relieve them to go there. And actually what, what we're worried about is that we're wasting money on interventions that probably don't have any efficacy or they've uh, not yet proven their efficacy um, in independent studies. And at the moment, if you have a clinical intervention and you want it on the uh, nice guidance lift, you have to prove bang for book that that improves your quality of life years before you have it recommended. But yet we don't extrapolate that to surgical training interventions or education interventions as far as I can see in other specialties. And we think that has huge problems, one, for sustainability and also for EDI because we know a lot of tech interventions make the EDI problem worse and surgery is probably one of the worst specialties. Next slide, please. So we came up with this idea of an education intervention framework, and this isn't necessarily limited to surgery um, if there's interest from other specialties. And we approached um, IDEAL. So IDEAL is a uh, surgical framework for pragmatic surgical trials to demonstrate efficacy and also it tries to reduce heterogeneity. So rather than everything going to a randomised controlled trial, what it does is allows people to study things in a rigorous way, um, implement findings and be able to compare and contrast surgical trials, which historically we've been really poor at. So we've approached them to try and adopt a similar, um, a similar strategy because we think the same problem exists in education literature. And then our HR have kindly backed us um, and come on board with our clinical education incubator just last week. Next slide, please. So we think this will help with evidence-based assessment of these technologies. We think hopefully it'll be a pivot point for the educational theorists to a surgeons we think just sit in an office um, and, and read lots of papers um, and perhaps try and bring them more to the forefront of what's going on in pragmatic training environments. We hope it will help with responsible spending for those that adopt it. And we hope that hopefully um, the evidence that's generated from the studies that use the framework will be more easier for funding bodies like Health Education England to digest where on that pathway from blue sky thought all the way through to something which is able to be implemented nationally, a surgical training intervention is, whether it's industry led or built in house. Next slide, please. So at the moment, we know we've got a different healthcare challenge than we had 15, 10 years ago. We know we need innovators who are part of their workforces who can adopt new technologies and introduce them into their trust. We've got a new generation of doctors that think differently. They want different things. They're not as satisfied, arguably, um, with their careers as perhaps years gone by. We've got a shift in the way we deliver our workforce in surgery. It's the extended surgical team, and you'll be well, um, well aware of the, the pilot that HU's funded. Next slide, please. And it feels like we've been here before. So this is the Richard Horse paper from the 90s, which demonstrates that research um, probably wasn't quite as good as it was in surgery. And on the papers, uh, um, on the right side, is a paper from probably the leading methodologist in surgery in the country, which suggests that innovation is perhaps a dirty word. And things which improve some research will be getting in under the carpet a little bit under the term innovation. Next slide, please. Most of you will remember this report. It was sort of the starter, um, starter for 10 for integrated academic training in the Walpole report, which tried to address the problems which Richard Walter put in his Lancet editorial. Next slide, please. So what we propose is integrated innovation training, and this is a work in progress. We've had a number of discussions with um, members who are part of the committees that contribute to this board meeting and also the NIHR. 
And we think that this could potentially be adopted a bit like our integrated academic tra training programme, where the money comes from, whether or not that's shared with competitive tender to industry as part of their time out, um, what the market for success is in academia, it's spot on funding and a successful PhD. The innovation is probably going to be different to that. But we think this could help make everyone an adopter, make everyone be able to assess new technology about whether or not it would be useful for their care for patients or indeed in the trusts they work in. And we're meeting with Tony Young, who you'll know from the Clinical Entrepreneurship Programme, to try and work out where the overlap is, because there is a little bit. Um, but what we think is that this will hopefully be able to keep people in our NHS system. Next slide, please. We know people leave, and the numbers are probably lagging behind a little bit. This is the Foundation Doctor report from, uh, from 12 months ago. Um, and we think people are moving into this space more and more. People are leaving to go and work in tech. They're going to work in areas of innovation. And actually, why can't we harness that capability and build that into our training programmes in an integrated fashion? So we just launched the RCS Asset Innovation Skills course, run at cost, to try and set people along this pathway, pathway and give them skills to be able to adopt innovations within the trust they're working in. Next slide, please. Final points. If we're not going to produce in-house the technological uh, surgical training interventions that companies are producing, then we need to work out how to go to them and work with them, assess their technologies in a way which is digestible for us um, and make sure that we don't give them access to progression points without rigorous evaluation, because I think that'd be a disaster. Next slide, please. So finally, there's loads of nuance in the report. There's loads of um, novel things which we think are useful, but unless we fund training appropriately and responsibly, most of it will be a waste of time. Without an appropriate staff workforce, we're not going to be able to utilise the technologies or at least test them, um, we think. Um, we hope that the framework that we propose will help with the evidence base, uh, responsible spending, and to make things more sustainable and equitable. And a plea, really, can we be proactive rather than reactive? Um, robotics is a good example. We think we're making the same mistakes we did with laparoscopic surgery as we are with robotics. I'll leave it there. Apology, it was quick. Uh Quick and incredibly eloquent from both of you, so thank you very much. Um, uh, what are we doing? Are we going straight to the uh, The danger is, this is such a rich conversation, we end up losing points that were made right at the beginning because we pile into the next um, uh, set of transformation objectives. But Charlotte, come on, let's um, get your voice in the room. Thank you. Um Apologies, I couldn't be there today. I'm on call, so someone's anxiously holding the bleep for me in theatres. But anyway, I'm going to take you through a whistle-stop tour of um, robotic assisted surgery and what I've been doing this year and um, why we're doing this work. So brief introduction to myself. Um, my name is Charlotte Elside. I'm an ST6 in general surgery, and I'm the RCS and HE Robotics Research Fellow. Um, so next slide, please. So I just want to talk to you briefly about how surgeries evolved. So the first picture on the left shows traditional analog surgery, open surgery. You can see the surgeon is bent over doing a challenging operation. His assistant is trying to assist, get to look in. You can see the trainees in the background trying to see what's going on, engage in understanding as to the procedure and how to do the case. But surgeries evolved with time and We've now moved on to minimally invasive to laparoscopic surgery. And today we've entered the era of digital surgery using robotics. Here we can see Mr. Doug Speak using the CMR console to perform a procedure. And this here on the right is the actual CMR robot performing the operation. So surgery now has become more slick, more advanced, more niche. You can see the surgeons operating at ease and the trainees can easily see what's going on. So it's a far better training platform. Next slide, please. So robotics itself has evolved. So the first robotic procedure recorded was in 1985, and that was by the Puma 560, performed the neurosurgical, uh, a neurosurgical biopsy. The same robot was modified to the ProBot, which performed the world's first TURP, TURP, um, so transurethral uh, prostatectomy. And then here on the right is the SRI International. So this was the prototype for the Da Vinci robot, which is the robot which has now dominated the market worldwide across the specialities. Um, next slide, please. So you can see in the top left, this is a robot that most of us are familiar with. So this is the Da Vinci from Intuitive. Uh, and that is the advanced version of the SRI, which we just saw. To the right is the CMR robot. So this was developed by Cambridge Medical Robotics. This robot's called the Versius. And this is the robot we could see Mr. Speak using in previous slides. 
Here in the uh, corner on the left, we can see the Hugo robot. This is by Medtronic. Hugo is taking off in the UK, but it has done in Europe. Um, very interesting platform, fantastic views, fantastic robot. And to the right, we can see the Dexter, which is predominantly being used in gynecology. Next slide, please. So why do we want to use robotic assist surgery? What, what's so special about it? Well, I mentioned that we have advanced from open surgery to minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery, but laparoscopic surgery is quite cumbersome for the surgeon. Um, it's quite tiring upon your upper uh, limb muscles, your lower back as well. 60% of surgeons report musculoskeletal injury. Can we play the video, please, Matt, if possible? Are you able to do so? I don't know if this is going to work, unfortunately. Um, if the video does work, it will show how easy it is for the robotic arms to actually move. So the dissection, uh, the robotic hands themselves are able to rotate to nearly 360 degrees. Laparoscopic suturing, so stitching inside the abdomen is very difficult laparoscopically, but doing it robotically makes it very, very easy. And also access to the pelvis is far easier using a robotic platform than it is using a laparoscopic platform. So overall, robotic surgery makes minimally, inverse, minimally invasive surgery easier. We have better vision and we can offer the benefits of minimally invasive surgery or laparoscopic surgery using the robot instead. Can I have the next slide, please? What are the issues with robotic surgery at the moment? Well, the main issue is access. So there's a disparity in access across the country. The map on the right is from 2020, and this shows the robotic centres in England. However, this isn't representative of the subspecialities that are using the robot. And at the moment, the main users are urology in the UK followed on by general surgery and gynaecology. We also need to remember that with any new technology comes the learning curve. So at present, the consultants, their learning needs need to come first. So they are on their learning curve. After that will come the surgical trainees. So we're seeing a bottleneck situation whereby the senior trainees aren't getting access to having to wait until they've completed their surgical training or until they become a consultant before they can actually get trained on the robot. Um, can I have the next slide, please? COVID forces us into a, well, places us in a state of crisis, really. So surgical training um, was essentially put at standstill. We needed to change how we trained. We needed to be more efficient. We need to think outside the box. Um, and we need to improve our access to the operating theatre. Next slide, please. So, Matt, sorry, you're going to have to keep pressing click. Thank you. Um, so we've entered an era of of digitalized surgical training. So you can see on the top left, we've got somebody using a VR headset. So he's learning surgical skills outside of the operating room. On the right, you can see a dual console um, being used for robotic training, which is actually very unique for surgical training. The trainer can literally stop what the trainee's doing at the touch of a button and take over. So it means the trainee is immersed in this procedure. He can do the procedure, but if there is an error or he's about to do something wrong or he misunderstands the trainer, can automatically take over and here in the middle me disguised um, wearing uh, some glasses which allow for tele-mentoring so a uh, trainer can supervise me and pass on instructions next slide please robotics is also interesting because it actually provides us with a blueprint of our performance so like in an aeroplane, you have a black box, you have something similar with the robot. So we have the DV logger, which is at the back of the bedside console, and it's able to measure your kinematics. So number of errors, your movements, um, it's able to give you a blueprint at the end of the procedure. The graphs here at the bottom are produced from a publication by Andrew Hung, who's a urologist uh, in the United States. He does a lot of work looking at automations, automated metrics, which is what the box collects um, you can see the expert surgeon, actually his movements are very precise, whereas the novice, they're all over the place, they're quite haphazard. So actually by having a blueprint, it provides a training of their performance, but it also will make your learning more efficient and far more quicker. So despite all the advantages we have for robotic surgery, as Josh um, correctly said, we, we are lacking a curriculum in robotic surgery. And it's not just in the UK, this is globally. Next slide, please. 
So my job uh, working with the RCS and HEE was to define a standardised evidence-based curriculum and to unite all the current stakeholders. Holders. There's a lot of work that's already commenced, but we wanted to bring everyone to the table and try and do this together. Next slide, please. Sorry, you're going to have to keep pressing. Apologies. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so year one, what have I done? So I did a systematic review looking at how we measure our performance in robotic surgery because we knew that there are already quite a few metrics out there. Large review to summarise, um, we found 76 papers which fit the eligibility criteria and looked at all the subspecialities. Next slide. Um, this is just a brief overview of how we assess the papers. I'm conscious of time. Next, next slide, please. So all in all, we, we found seven, 27 metrics, which we split into task-based, procedural-based, cognitive and global measures. You can see looking at this as a trainer, where would you begin? How would you decide which metric to use to assess your trainee? It's very difficult. So not only do we not have a training curriculum, but we don't have an accurate way or reliable way of measuring our trainee's performance. Next slide, please. Reinvents, as Josh touched on, is a qualitative study which we launched in August. And here we wanted to assess all the stakeholders involved in robotic training, their views on how to deliver training, what barriers we would be encountering and how we can overcome these barriers and essentially devise or plan how we could create a curriculum. Next slide, please. I just want to take you through a few themes that have come from the interview and a few codes, but the main themes that emerged were um, access. So as we touched on before, limited access. Access was very much governed as well geographically, so where you're based and also by industry. So industry allowing you access. Josh touched on laparoscopic surgery. So robotic surgery, where we're at at the moment, feels very reminiscent of where we were back in the early 90s when laparoscopic surgery was brought in. It feels like it was brought in quite late down the line, um, too late, some would say. A lot of the, the, the robotic trainers themselves felt that we should be delivering training at a far earlier stage. And this goes back to what the FOSS test report um, reported in August 2022, saying that we should actually have a core curriculum. Trainees should learn early on in their surgical training, robotic skills, how to bedside assist, etc. Time is interesting. So trainees and trainers felt that time was very much a measure of their performance. And they felt that if you're a slow surgeon, it meant you're a bad surgeon. So time in itself as a metric of performance is not reliable. But that seems to be the only metric we're using right now. And the interesting point was competency. So when I asked the surgeons, how were you deemed as being competent? They couldn't answer the question. They didn't know how they were assessed. Um, talk to me to now. Next slide, please. Um, so just a couple of interesting quotes. So one, one surgeon said that training, it's like talking about unicorns. It doesn't exist. Um, and that he felt that robotic surgery should be seen as a basic surgical skill. So we should be teaching at a core trainee, just like you would with BSS, the BSS course, and we should make it mandatory. Um, and somebody else said in terms of growth, they couldn't see a future without uh, there being a robot by the patient's bedside in the operating theatre. Next slide, please. So where are we going with year two? Well, we plan to complete the study, um, interviewing around 60, uh, 60 people involved within the stakeholder groups. And finally, we are launching a randomised control trial with the biggest robotic centre in Europe, the All Sea Centre, where is I've just returned from a few weeks ago, um, looking at implementing a core curriculum using one of the objective metrics that we devised from the systematic review. It's 12 o'clock. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Uh, brilliant. Uh, thanks, Charlotte. Um, so, um, so there's a trade-off to be had here. You, you can have another um, 15 minutes or so on this. Uh, which means you don't get a break between public and private board, or you can have your 15 minute break. Um, so um, I'm in your hands. No pressure. Well, no, it's a straight, we're all adults, it's a straight conversation. I think it's a brilliant, guys, I have to say. I, um, we talk a lot about transformation and actually you're beginning to set it out. I think the thing that's brilliant is. Um, 
you are clinicians who are inventing a different future than the present reality or the past reality, and you're taking the lead in setting that out. And I think that is how change is going to happen, uh, personally. And um, I think that's terrific. So uh, I, I'm voting, but we go straight yes. through, quite frankly. Um, but I mean, other people's hands here. Who's signalling they want to come in? Just, uh, just wave at me. Sorry. All right. Um, let, 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 I'm going to carry on, but um, we must move on uh, to our because we've got other colleagues from HE that have travelled to be with us today to do this um, last item and we can clear the business away. So, um, Joe. Thank you, it's brilliant. Um, can I just check from, from a very high level, what I think we're saying is the gap between what's technologically possible and what we're able to deliver is, is growing because we haven't got the system right. And when you were, when I was doing four, I wondered why you didn't refer to nine. Because my instinct initially was like, well, we had the same problem with pharmacological in two, pre-2000. We had no way for assessing. So there was an equity and an, an efficacy and efficiency problem that we solved with a national organisation. And I wondered if you looked at that and deliberately went for this bottom of crowdfunding. So, because actually, as you talked, I thought we've got three problems. We've got this gap between what's technically possible to deliver, the lack of an assessment centre to evaluate efficacy and, and efficiency. And also we've got um, a lack of process to make sure we've got the money, the staff and the skills and the competencies to actually deliver it. And what you're saying potentially solves all those three problems. If you're saying what you do is you embed it in the training process both into the so you build that learning and innovation stretch within it and that becomes your crowdsourcing way of of actually building in the evaluation the tests and the assessment rather than creating a separate thing and i just wonder is that what you're saying and did you do that deliberately did you look at that sort of after the event nice top top down model you say actually this is the way we need to go because if it is it's really neat so will you hold it let me get yeah. the comments and then i promise you you can have the last word so um my my way into that is how innovation in practice, the centre's always lag behind innovation in practice and what does it we need to do to catch up? Uh, because a regulatory infrastructure, I use regulatory in its broader sense, I don't mean the professional regulators, quality regulators, um, have got to play to catch up because you're innovating at the practice level, not at the centre. Uh, Andrew, I think. Yes. Th thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I guess all what, what I found really interesting is all of the metrics that you were talking about were metrics around skills um, and there were metrics around either the acquisition or the measurement or the uh, um, ascertainment of skills and I'd be really interested in what your research pulled out about the impact positive and negative and what we need to do about it about professionalism of our surgical. Andrew's done a lot of work on professionalism just to <laughs> disclose. So um, just more, more. Um, it's a great question. Uh, other than the comment, I've, I've, it may feel very old because as a former theatre nurse, the introduction of lap coleys in the UK was something that I remember <laughs> happening um, at the time. Um, but uh, it's, one of the things for me is, is, is the pace of change and curriculum design. How is it going to keep up? So I'm really interested in that. And you talked and touched upon team. I mean, these are complicated things to get right. And actually, the quality of the teaching is also predicated on the quality of the team that sits around the, the product and the development. So I'm kind of interested about what the kind of blend is out towards ODPs, operating theatre nurses, nursing associates, etc. Uh, great question. Uh, Wendy? Yeah, thanks. Great. Fantastic, guys. Um, really nice to see you as well. Um, so I'm really ancient. Um, so, you know, I remember laparoscopy with you know, bottles of fluid rather than gas. Yeah. <laughs> But I think what's really interesting about this is that perhaps what, we're, what, we're, what we've exposed here is a lack of educationalist input, academic educationalist input to how we have developed you know, 69 different curricula, a programme for delivering them, and an educational process that is simply, you know, yes, you're OK, you're signed off, you're out. So I, I think there's something that, that we've talked in the past in HE about our lack of academic educational input into how we choose what we invest in um, and I think that's something perhaps for the future to think about in the UNHS England. Uh, I do think that the um, challenges between the transition from analogue surgery, which I love that term, I was, I'm not going to call myself an analogue surgery, <laughs> um, through to a, uh, I think, a multitude of approaches to the surgical patient it will never just be one thing. Uh, and I think what really interested me was that 
I think you've been able to do this work because of the completely different approach to the curriculum that the Royal College of Surgeons supported through mm. our late colleague Claire Marks. So I think that functional change in the curriculum from outcomes that were ticked off through to the actual, are you capable of managing this patient, not just doing this piece of surgery? I think that's allowed that. And that's a real lesson for us in terms of conversations we have with other colleges about curriculum isn't just a list of things you do. And that, that goes into your professional approach as well. So I think this is really exciting work. More for me, will you just say a bit more about your point about the lack of academic education being put into this. What, what, well, what do you fundamentally, mean? as a country, we have very little investment, particularly in postgraduate medical education. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, Jam. Jam. And there's no credibility in it. It's not, it's, not, it's not something that you put in your CV if you want to. So going back to Joel's point, it's a gap. It's a big gap. Yeah. Uh, Jam. I think this is incredibly rich because it seemed to me to be getting into bigger questions than even the, the yeah. training in terms of the, you know, the evidence base for what you do as as a profession of surgeons. And I mean, I sponsored NICE for five years, and NICE could only work with what was there. Um, and I think what what this is saying is that this is worth a much bigger audience, bluntly, than I mean, it's really important for, for the training of future surgeons. But you're raising so much broader questions that I think as we move into NHS England, frankly, people like Andrew would be jolly interested in, uh, in thinking about you know, how people are how people are learning and what the evidence space for what works is or not, given the pressures we're under. Yeah, uh, precisely. This is why I wanted it to come here and I'm delighted that colleagues have been able to join us. Uh, this is a conversation I've had with Patrick because, because of exactly this issue. We talk a lot about transformation. My heart sank when I saw the board papers, 300 and whatever it is. <laughs> um, and um, actually, I, I then reconnected with the report. It is such a rich document. It is such a rich document. And the demonstration of the practical applications of technology and the difference it makes is just spelled out really, really clearly. It does deserve persevering with. So those of you that, whose heart sank, I, I do... <laughs> Um, encourage you to dip in and out of it to get a sense of uh, a sense of some of this. Um, my question will be: Could you say a little bit about the penetration of the robots into it? So some of this is going to be driven by the penetration of the robots. So some trusts have virtually every operating theatre with a robot in. Yet, as I understand it, some trusts are a long way off getting robots in, and the acquisition of the skill to use the technology is going to be dependent on whether it's there or not, I guess. So um, I don't know how you're going to do this. Um, I've got them written down. Thank in you. terms <laughs> of we're going to swap. You're going to swap. Yeah. And uh, Charlotte, I will come to you. Just uh, It's difficult when you're not in the room to join in a conversation where everybody else is in the room. But um, um, Josh and Martin are going to kick <clears> off. Um, I'll come to you, Charlotte, to make sure that um, we get your view as well. But um, the double lights off, you go. I'm going to take the first point of the gap and kind of will bridge with the curriculum and the evidence behind the current training infrastructure. So at the premise, when Josh suggested this as chair, all the structures currently exist uh, and mechanisms, but there was no connection between them all. And fundamentally, I think at the outset, what the main aim was to establish what that framework could look like as a, as a potential. And I think that's something that we would like to see advance further from, from today is really the interest in formalising the framework and uh, instituting that. Um, behind the evidence of, of, of what we do in training, the, the sheer fact that the chair of the JCST has written in the report, I think demonstrates a commitment that we need to evolve at pace. And the GMC and in, in introducing the new curriculum specifically referenced that we need to look at the curriculum more regularly than, than historically we would we would have done. So I think those are all the organisations that should be involved now are beginning to understand that we need to adapt the mechanisms where robotics currently is not in UK surgical curriculum. But in terms of the training committees of surgery, I, we, in terms of us that we sit the most, and they've all made a standing item for robotic surgery. In other words, it's actively and, and continually being, being discussed, but it's formal introduction to the curriculum of what we get at the end of training now needs to kind of be accelerated in, a, in, in the mechanism such as FOSS test suggests. And I think that whenever we kind of get behind the, the, the research and the studies, 
Josh has kind of created, I would say, what we feel to be the, the best examples. And I'm going to discuss that in terms of what we thought was important in the report. Yeah, so in terms of the nice strategy for pharmacological interventions, um, we thought about almost mimicking what they did, yeah. but because this is the first time all those stakeholders have come together yeah. in any project, as far as I can see, for the last 10, 15 years. So we, we didn't want to bite off, but not bite off what they could do, but promised more than we thought could be achievable. So we thought just having this meeting is an achievement from the report. Yeah. Um, second thing was the professionalisation issue, and it links to what um, Professor Reid said about um, how our uh, training programs are designed and there is a feeling and there's a little bit of anecdote and a bit of data around this is there has been a deprofessionalization of our profession over the last five to ten years and um, for that reason people are coming into training and going oh well you only have to achieve bare minimum there isn't a push for excellence there isn't a push for well this is where you are if you're flying and what else could you be doing and can you be pushed on a bit further and the reason why that's important for robotics is actually the the greatest chance of a robot being introduced to a new centre is a um, newly qualified consultant who's had some robotic practice who comes in, writes the business case, and then gets the robot brought. Yeah, where's my robot? Yeah. So if you don't train people coming through, in my opinion, and this is only anecdotal, I think you reduce the take of robotics throughout the rest of the country. Um, there was a point about curricula and teams. Um, so our surgical training curriculum took six years um, to, to, to change, and they only came out um, in 2021. Um, gynecology ahead of us, um, so that new curriculum comes out next year and, and robotics features as part of that, um, so a little bit sad and disappointed about it, um, but hopefully we can we can uh, mimic what they've done. Um, with regards to the extended surgical team, um, we've been heavily involved in that pilot and Martin has been lead, leading on work with Jill Tierney, um, and we've done some qualitative stuff on how those groups interact, what they feel um, like towards each other, particularly when they clash on rotors. There's no real currency conversion between those from a nursing background and those from um, different backgrounds to medics um, and what we found is and there was a comment earlier on about and um, people want to feel valued as if there's progression the main finding from that study is that if you put people in roles no matter what background if there's no progression and no next step and no investment in their future they leave they don't want to be a part of it so they're committing for a couple of years because the pay's there it's a bit better than what they've done they've got a two-year master's out of it but actually in terms of long -term, long term workforce plan our prediction is that it's probably not sustainable unless there's that three foot um, and then the final thing was about evidence base. And hopefully you'll see from the report that we've absolutely grounded everything we've said in what the literature shows. And that's probably a little bit behind on what the companies are doing. But we didn't want to be blue sky. We wanted to say, right, this is where we're at. And this is what we think needs to happen. And I completely agree. Um, any involvement from academic institutions um, is going to be needed if we're going to assess these technologies in a rigorous manner. Charlotte, do you want to come in? Um, so just the point about the extended surgical team, so it's actually a really good point when we think about robotic training. I think a lot of focus so far has been solely on training the console surgeon, but I think we have overlooked that actually you do have a bedside assistant who's actually manning the robots, or docking and undocking, and you also have your theatre staff. So this is something that we are very contentious of in our research, and this is something that we hope to implement as well. So we're looking at not just training the console surgeon, but also the wider surgical team as well. So the theatre staff also making the anaesthetists aware, et cetera. And when we talk about penetration, so yes, we have seen that predominantly urology own the most number of robots. But what we are seeing is that the other surgical subspecialities are proposing business plans alongside the urologists, et cetera, allowing them to also have access as well. Um, so it may be that we have to take a positive approach and work with the other subspecialities in order to gain access uh, within a unit. Okay, uh, excellent. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, Naveena um, absolutely, which just uh, wrote out uh, a number of points about the transition to the new NHS England and about how to ensure um, uh, we can actually design the function to keep innovation going. So it's actually how do we get the continuity, Patrick, I think, between the work that you've been doing, Chris, the work that you've been doing with uh, HE colleagues, and uh, Charlotte, I guess your work as well as a HE uh, shared fellow. Um, and uh, well, she makes a number of other points which are important about the transition that we need to capture. Look, I think it's been a terrific session. It sounds like you've come over from Ireland for the session as well. So thank you very much for travelling. Um, <coughs> 
uh, all, all three of you, incredibly eloquent and fluent in terms of what you've set out. I, I think the future surgery report allied to Eric Topple's work and then this further future of surgery report is a real demonstration of um, uh, how we invent the future, basically, and um, uh, begin to look at how technology is assisting us, which is the theme from Framework 15. And uh, Barney's gone now, but um, is what we're trying to do about. So if we assume 15 years in the future, this is a default rather than actually uh, an innovation. What does surgical training look like and what do we need to do to get to preparing people for that uh, world? And uh, so I think you've nicely drawn a lot of themes together that we've had as a board over the past 12 months, as well as actually have some difficult and challenging questions of the further work that we actually need to do. So um, there's a number of people around the table that will make the transition to NHS England and I think we'll get some of the continuity for the work through uh, uh, through um, through that transition. But we need to build some of the, the governance I think you referred to in the site. We need to build the governance to ensure that the transition isn't just about people. Uh, uh, it's also about the themes and the issues and uh, the way we build uh, organisations going forward. So a big thank you. Uh, thank you for staying for the whole of the meeting uh, as well. And um, a big thank you to you, Chris, for the work that you do uh, for HGE. I also want to call out Paul Sadler, who isn't here today, but um, I know has done a lot of work and has now become the postgraduate dean down in the South East. And um, I've had numerous conversations with Paul about uh, the reports that the college have produced. Um, so that's um, uh, a big thank you to to Paul um, and Patrick. A big thank you to you and your team for taking bets on things which um, uh, don't always look like they're going to work. But actually, what is it? Something like eight out of ten innovations don't work. But to get the two, you need to bet on the ten. And um, so thank you for uh, the leadership that you've demonstrated to get to where we are. Um, guys, it was terrific. Um, I get friends. great confidence from uh, seeing, if I may, your generation sees the future. So uh, thanks very much. Charlotte, I include you in that as well. Um, the rest of us are out. Uh, <laughs> a hard bit you squeeze in. But, um, <laughs> right, thank you. <laughs> Before I insult anybody else. Um, uh, somebody said they need to leave. Uh, it's Mark, I think. Yeah. Um, Mark, thanks. Um, just right, come on, let's change chairs. Uh, yeah. Who's driver? Come on down. Right. Um, I can't keep up with the office. Let alone the beams. Right. Um, we asked at our October meeting for an update on some of the work that's been done on engagement with trainees. And I think we had a fair bit on nursing and we yeah. wanted a bit more on medicine and dentistry. Yeah. Well, it's you. You've got 15. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so if we do some introductions. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, Matt, are you online? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, I heard it. Yeah, yes. Um, um, do you want it? Yeah, so I'm Emma Harper, um, senior comms and engagement manager. Um, Matt, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name's Matt Bysso Cook. I'm a neurosurgery ST5 based down in Plymouth, and I'm also an HEE Southwest Leadership Fellow. Um, and I'm Gertie Thomas Scooby, <clears throat> and I'm the head of engagement. Um, so I'll start off with a very brief overview, hand over to Emma, and then Matt's um, going to do stuff as well. So it was just a flag that unfortunately all paper that we wrote, which have input from Lee and Wendy, Mark and Bev, wasn't in the pack of papers. So that will be circulated afterwards. So apologies for that. Um, <clears throat> so the main thing I wanted to say was um, this is a collaborative piece of work um, with colleagues from across HEE. Um, bringing um, everybody together to, to work on this with our learners. Um, we've got a user-centred approach, so we're engaging with students, learners and trainees, um, listening to them to understand what they need and want. Um, it's a multi 
with disciplinary approach, bringing together good practice from across the HE and sharing learning. Um, and we found that bringing together the national and regional engagement is helping us to scope out work together, have sort of smaller projects, either nationally or in a region, and then to deliver that work collaboratively um, more widely across HEE. Um, so, passing over to Emma. So I'm going to give you a bit of an update on the work that we've been doing specifically with um, engagement of doctors and dentists in training. Um, we ran some focus groups with fellows um, at the like that last year, and we started with fellows because we thought we'd engage with a cohort that were already kind of engaged with us, you know, working with us, um, and we wanted to kind of develop a relationship with. Um, doctors and dentists in training who could then help us reach their peers because we know how important peer-to-peer -peer kind of engagement is with this um, group. So um, we're now looking at delivering some other uh, regional um, engagement for uh, more focus groups with the training engagement forums in the region so we're just talking about delivering those over the next few months. One of the things that's kind of come apparent in this obviously when we're kind of covering what's in the paper but um, you know we know there's only so much we can do in terms of impacting on trainees' lives. So, you know, we can impact and affect, bring change to um, training and education, but we know that there's lots of elements outside of our control that impact on training experience. So whilst we can't always control those, we can be a listening organisation and we can be sympathetic and empathetic to those issues. So I think one of the things we're going to be looking at is kind of really drilling down into what the values are of uh, current doctors and dentists training. And we, we know we want them to know that their values are assigned, aligned with our values, um, not just as HE, but also as we move into the new NHS England. We think there's loads of opportunities for us to kind of do more in this space that we know we're trying to uh, fill a gap that exists. This is a very large, diverse audience that can be, you know, it's multi-generational, it can be segmented in many different ways. So in order to kind of, you know, really drill down, we would probably need some investment and um, resource to do this. So for example, like the crowdsourcing that we've done internally. So the work that we've been concentrating on is kind of been like quick wins and, you know, things that have very limited costs. Um, another thing we've done is establish an internal working group. So this came at the request of postgraduate deans that we continue this work through transition. So on this group, we have national and regional colleagues, as well as trainees, fellows and stakeholder engagement managers. And we're just making sure that we're aligning our national priorities with our regional priorities with this work. And um, before I hand over to Matt, um, I'm just going to we launched a um, uh, Training Bulletin in Southwest. This is a pilot that we were doing. We um, launched it in November. The first issue went out in November. The second issue is due to go out later this month. Um, and before I pass over to Matt, he will share his experiences of working on the bulletin. Just wanted to tr um, share some of the stats from the book from the first issue. We delivered it to 5,153 people. We had an open rate of 64%, which is just under 3,300 and a click to open rate, which is people that clicked on a link um, of that 64%, 21% of the people that did that. So that's just under 700 people that clicked on a link in the bulletin. And just to put that in a bit of context, for a normal kind of um, cold sort of bulletin or email that gets sent out, the average open rate is 21% and the average clicked open rate is 2.6%. So we think for a first issue of a kind of bulletin that we have really warmed people up to we've done pretty well and it's sort of on par with other regional bulletins that go out so i'm going to pass over to matt who's going to talk about his experience of working on the bulletin. hello can you see and hear me yeah. yeah yeah you can great um so thank you very much for having me i um i've introduced myself somewhat already so i'm a neurosurgery registrar at st5 in plymouth i also am on a secondment with HEE Southwest as a leadership fellow that I've been doing since October. And I've also worked with um, specialised commissioning as a clinical policy lead a number of years ago, which really began my interest in all of this. So I'm here to talk to you with two separate hats on, really. So one as a doctor in training and one as a leadership fellow, really relating to how we've been piloting a regular regional bulletin in the Southwest and Seven Patches to try and improve engagement of those in training with the regional HEE. 
so I guess as a doctor in training I you know I spend a lot of time reviewing receiving um, and deleting numerous emails per day from hospital organizations colleges institutions which generally contributes to overload and I've I've often found this akin to leading listening to a poorly tuned radio and occasionally you tune into something of relevance that clearly piques the interest the problem is that it's time consuming to sort the wheat from the chaff and I do know of some quite technologically savvy colleagues that have set up filters rules that delete emails before they've even been read but the problem is that ultimately the main lines of communication from large organizations is is via email and numerous opportunities for personal professional development can be hidden away and easily missed which is a particular focus for those in training when they're considering competitive applications so for myself this fellowship that I'm doing that was clearly that was only identified through email and I've also just joined the Southwest Clinical Senate Council, which just purely came up as an email that I'd almost discarded. So if I put on my fellow hat on, as part of my fellowship, my supervisor, Dr. Furlow, asked as one of my roles if I wanted to be involved in a pilot bulletin to try and improve the engagement with the pat from the patches. And I think from my own anecdotal observations and discussion with peers is there's clearly been a progressive change in the attitude and engagement of doctors with their work and their organisations. And this is obviously clear in the current political climate. Also regarding the kind of other experiences that I've seen. So within our neurosurgical training sphere, we also have a regular bulletin that gives us loads of beneficial information that otherwise you would never have really heard about. So I was quite keen to be involved with this. The role of our bulletin um, has really been manifold to, to highlight available opportunities, provide updates from the region and beyond, and put faces to names. We've only done one so far, but I've, I've noticed numerous advantages that I've seen from this. It's succinct, it's well-processed information, and you can easily review it. Um, it's co-created with consultants and doctors in training, so the editorial spin does maintain focus on what I think the readership needs, and we've got autonomy on content. So I've, I've got a screaming baby in the background, so I do apologise if uh, if that's coming through. Um, we've also got support from the communications team to help facilitate dissemination and engagement. And it's visually clear, so it's, um, you know, you can see it very easily on your smartphone. And we're hoping to get more feedback with, with time so that we can evolve to suit the needs of, of the readership. I've actually found it very enjoyable to be part of something novel that aims to improve the working life of trainees, because I think morale is low um, and from my own perspective it's made me think about what I think is important and what others think is important which I think is a really important thing um, there we go thank you very much oh, thanks, thanks. Um, terrific will you just say a bit about what we began this meeting uh, three hours ago talking about uh, nets going out at the end of the month mm -hmm. we just make the connection between this work and the survey which yeah. um, We'll get great penetration, I think, if I've understood the data. Yeah, so <clears throat> Nets, what the information about Nets was actually included in the paper. Um, ah. So <laughs> the engagement with Nets has increased this year. It's the highest that it's ever been. Um, I know that Noella was actually the person who I think was quite instrumental in that happening. He, obviously, I am doing the role that she was doing previously. Um, but there was a lot of national regional work that went on to improve the engagement with that. So, um, yeah, I think it was a good connection and, and a lot of work. So I'm, I'm really sorry that you haven't had the stats about that because it is all in the paper. Uh, I, I was thinking, oh, good, a two-page report. This is the benchmark. And it's, now you're telling me there was 20 pages. I think, yeah. We'll get that round to people. And I, I think we should get the slides that um, was in the last item as well. Yeah. Um, any questions or comments to colleagues, uh, Matt down in Plymouth or um, uh, here in the room with uh, Verity and um, Emma? Not so much a question, but just a quick follow up. That one of the things we're really looking at as we build the new organisation is how we take our focus on students and trainees and learners as a unique audience of ours into the new NHS England, and that's partly through why we will have an embedded function within the WTNE supporting communication and engagement, and partly through why this work around these, these unique audiences. That, and I think somebody said earlier that these are people that NHS England have never dealt with before in this sort of level on the.
with um, with learners around transition and actually at the working group last week that was on our agenda as one of them, which is what do trainees need to know what do they want to know how do we so we have started some of those conversations already in some of the groups that we're talking and i think it's about how we develop those to, to get the messages out so it's, it's yeah there's a line in the paper it actually currently looks after 240,000 learners. I'm not sure we do look after them. <laughs> uh, and I don't mean we don't care, et cetera. That's not the point that I make. But um, actually our relationship to them is a different one. They are consumers of the product that we enable and facilitate we have provided, along with colleagues like John, who are running the higher education institutions. So I think couching our relationship with them correctly, but they are an absolutely essential source of feedback to us about what we do and how we do it. Do you want the last word? Um, well, I didn't want the last word, but I just, I, I, an observation that, you know, the end of the meeting has taken the circle just back to the beginning with the, the point Joe was making around retention yeah. and the link between CPD engagement and retention. So it's sort of uh, nice uh, very top well and tail. Yeah. Uh, see, there is some point in those meetings about what we're going to do. <laughs> Beautifully planned. No, no, no. Uh, right. Um, Thank you. Uh, terrific. Uh, Matt, thank you very much. I hope the baby is not too disruptive. Given everything you're doing, I'm surprised you've got time for any of the process. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, thanks very much and good luck with everything that you're doing as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Patrick, if I may, I'm just going to draw attention to the report that we're there for information and awareness. Uh, really important. I, I don't think... Um, as chair over the past four years, I've done enough justice dragging the digital stuff onto our agenda. So um, uh, you can all take your own responsibility for this. I'm doing my big Harry thing about accountability. Um, but um, uh, it's just a way of getting some sunlight and oxygen uh, and um, rainwater onto these really important pieces of work which are about pushing the agenda. So um, uh, I almost feel guilty. Uh, passing over them in that way, but we're right up against it as time as we can see. Um, so with that, I've not been notified of any other business, so I'll, I'll, I'll close this aspect of the meeting. Um, can I ask you not to go to lunch? Um, but uh, please get up. Uh, five